to this morning's session of the leadership conversation series and we are focusing on the pharmaceutical industry COVID-19 has brought so many things you know some are positive some are negative but also giving us the realization that there are so many things that we could do that we hadn't done and one such area uh, that we could focus on is the pharmaceutical industry and today we will have a conversation around the AFC FTA itself on the one hand and how the pharmaceutical industry can also take advantage of that and the post-COVID uh, realities to also develop. So on that note, I'd like to welcome you again to this event. And we are hosting this program in the, at the headquarters of Carl Bank, uh, a very beautiful uh, office and a very beautiful auditorium, a very intimidating auditorium, I must say. And um, we are also very lucky to be graced with the MD of Carl Bank, Mr. Philip Oredu. And we are very honored to have you, sir. And we invite you at this point to come and give us the welcome address for today's function. Shall we put our hands together for the MD? Good morning, everyone. And, uh, it's a pleasure to have all of you here uh, to join us in a series of conversations that we do have on topical issues. Today, uh, we are honored to have in our midst various distinguished uh, persons. Uh, we're supposed to have a uh, Deputy Min uh, Minister for Trade and Industry with us. I'm sure his representative is, is here. Uh, Mr. Prudence Sabahizi, the Chief Technical Advisor of AFCFTA uh, Secretariat. Dr. Farid Arthur, Chairman of the National AFCFTA uh, Coordination Office. Pharmacist Harrison Abutuate, Chairman of GNCOP. Mr. Bryce Simmons, Vice President, Imani Africa. Mr. Ude Bashka, Director General, Pharmacy Export Promotion Council of India. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you all. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome all of you, those here in person and those who have joined virtually to the Carl Bank Leadership Conversation Series. This is our 11th edition, and with every conversation held, the insights gleaned have always been worth the discussion. We are pleased that you have all joined us, especially our strategic partners, the Ghana National Chamber of Pharmacy, our distinguished panel of speakers, and all dignitaries for taking time to be with us this morning for this important topical discussion. Today's co conversation themed AFC FTA and the post-COVID era, the growth of the pharmaceutical sector in Ghana is one of many conversations and initiatives lined up by the bank to present market opportunities to our stakeholders. It is important for us as a bank to continuously engage our various clients and partners as we seek to grow forward together. One of our key corporate social investment pillars and a key SDG is health, which we believe together we must support in the building of our health infrastructure and delivery of a nation and, and delivery as a nation and a continent. AFCFTA provides a wider market access across Africa for the pharmaceutical industry and promotes interregional trade for mutual economic benefits while supporting investments locally. It also brings about synergies with industrial learning across borders and will benefit the industry through economies of scale, 
by virtue of new markets available to the pharmaceutical companies. COVID has taught us the bitter truth of investing in our health industry with special emphasis on the pharmaceutical sector. There is an urgent need for us to continuously invest in the development of critical drugs and improve the logistics necessary to support the growth. The most important aspect of the conversation is how to situate the opportunities offered by AFCFTA in, to the pharmaceutical industry. Recently at the uh, ordinary session of the Assembly of the African Union in Addis Ababa on the 5th of February, the president of AFDB Bank, I quote him, it is time to build Africa's healthcare defense system, which must be based on three strategic priorities. First, building Africa's quality healthcare infrastructure. Second, building Africa's pharmaceutical industry. And third, building Africa's vaccine manufacturing capacity. And this is the interesting part. Africa needs 600 million to 1.3 billion US dollars to meet its goal of attaining 60% vaccine production by 2040. Investing in health is investing in national security. And the African Development Bank plans to invest 3 billion US dollars to support pharmaceutical vaccine and manufacturing capacity for Africa. This is quite intriguing, and it tells us the sort of investment as a continent we need, and the platform that AFCFT provides to us to be able to develop our companies locally. This obviously is a significant opportunity to the Ghanaian pharmaceutical industry and institutions. A Scal Bank are poised to support this. The subject matter of today's conversation is very appropriate because the pharmaceutical industry presents an industry case given the importance it plays in keeping all of us healthy. Africa finds itself in a perilous position as it imports between 70 to 90 percent of the drugs it consumes. According to a 2019 rep report by McKinsey, Local manufacturers produce 25% to 30% of pharmaceutical products required by for the African market and less than 10% of medical supplies. Ladies and gentlemen, it is expected that AFCFTA can facilitate the creation of an, uh, of an environment conducive for rapidly accelerating the establishment of regional pharmaceutical establishments which can be leveraged as a springboard for nurturing African multinationals and creating jobs and prosperity. Currently, the bank has a pharma scheme which provides credits at concessionary rates to pharmaceutical companies to assist in building capacity through interventions and programs such as these. We seek to improve and expand on this offering to support the local manufacturing industry. With forums like this one, we seek to strengthen the relationship between Cal Bank and Ghana National Chamber of Pharmacy, increase the number of pharmaceutical companies assessing the bank's pharma scheme, and partner selected number of local pharmaceutical companies on AFCFTA program to grow into regional markets. The bank is also investing in building the capacity of pharmaceutical companies within our client, uh, our client database and more with conversations like these on the various topical issues to be discussed and deliberated on by our distinguished speakers and panelists. Ladies and gentlemen, I indulge you to join me as we attentively listen and engage our panelists to explore the opportunities available for the growth of the pharmaceutical sector in Ghana and learn from their expertise. Finally, let me encourage all stakeholders, those here present, those joined virtually, 
everyone in the sector to engage the bank's team so together we can grow our respective businesses. Enjoy the session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Reidri. So this is how the program is going to go. We are going to have perspectives from different uh, people representing different sectors of the pharmaceutical industry. We'll have a perspective from policy, that is from the Ministry of Trade and Industry. And then after that, we'll have a perspective from India. India serves as some sort of a role model as far as pharmaceutical, the pharmaceutical industry across the globe is concerned. And we'd like to hear their perspective as, as we also aspire to, to get to that level. And then we also have a perspective from an entrepreneur, somebody who has worked in the pharma industry and what his experiences has, have been and, and how that impacts on the conversation. And then also we'll hear from the financing institutions, specifically Carl Bank, on how they, what position they also can play in the, in the vision that we have. And then, and then, and then last but not the least, we'll hear from the AFCFTA on how this whole conversation also falls within the, the Continental Free Trade Agreement. Uh, preceding all those uh, uh, perspectives will be a presentation by the president of M Pedigree uh, in the person of Bright Simmons. Bright Simmons has had significant experience engaging various aspects of the pharmaceutical industry uh, to see how their innovative technologies together with the aspirations of the pharma industry could work together to address issues relating to counterfeiting, which is one thing that can significantly hamper the development of the pharmaceutical industry. And over the period, he has done so across different continents, uh, across actually three different continents. And so today, we are very honored to have him in our midst, who is going, and he is going to set the, the tone for the conversation. So I'd like to invite Bryce Simmons now, Bright, to come and then give his presentation. Shall we put our hands together for Bryce Simmons? Thank you. So first of all, I'm really delighted to be here with you. And so thanks to the Ghana Chamber of Pharmacy and to Carl Bank for inviting me to share these perspectives with you. Given the fact that we are pressed for time, I'll go straight to the presentation that I've prepared uh, for today. First of all, I'm going to text the clicker. It's working? Oh, OK, good. Thank you. So my, I should be positive in that, so good. My, um, my goal today is to try and situate, obviously, the opportunity for the pharmaceutical sector within the context of the Continental Free Trade Agreement, one of the most seminal developments of African integration since the founding fathers back in the 50s and 60s began this project of trying to create one continent. So we all know the stats that are often used to frame the agency in respect of AFTA. Most of us are familiar with those stats and everybody can Google them. But I think in respect of the vaccination situation, because of the context and the period in which we are in, the, this COVID situation, it's fascinating that Africa consumes 25% of the world's vaccines. Given that level of consumption, one would have thought that that alone will create some degree of apprehension that only 0.1% of vaccines in the world are supplied by Africa. I mean, if you consume 25%, that's a huge volume of global consumption. We are only like 16% of the world's population. But then to produce 0.1%, and of those that we produce for our continent, the majority of those actions are full and finished. Essentially, the actual formulation happens elsewhere, and we pack them. So that's what these statistics tell us. But we've known that for quite a while, 
including the fact that at this stage we even I think the clicker is really giving us challenges because okay oh, good at this stage we even import herbal medicine I wasn't aware that five percent of Ghana's herbal needs are now imported from China so clearly the inability to produce locally is a huge challenge and after has been framed primarily as the pathway to getting us to produce within the continent. If you look at the framework of AFTA, and I think Prudence is going to do a much better job of getting into the details, but fundamentally there are two phases. We are currently in phase one. The first phase is focused on the practical steps in the trade in goods sector. So making th sure that things like rules of origin, how do you determine that something was produced in Africa is set? Because otherwise, then we're going to have a situation where people go to China, produce a bunch of things, bring them into the country, and distribute them around the continent. So rules of origin are quite critical, and that's what has been going on for many, many months now, to get those in place. Tariffs. What are the duty levels you're going to set for products that are coming from other parts of Africa into our country? These are practical steps. The truth, though, is that the phase two discussions, which are yet to start, issues to do with competition policy, intellectual property, and the rest, are just as important just that to begin the process of even building a free trade area, it is important that you get the very basics right. If I want to bring something from Nigeria into Ghana, how much will I pay as duty? How do I prove that the product is actually coming from Nigeria? Those are the fundamentals, and those are the ones that we are currently setting. The next stage is then to recognize, as you can see from the timeline, that these things take a lot of time. We've been talking about an African economic union, an African economic community for decades. And after itself has been a 10-year journey, as you can see. So it takes time to get these things right. And it's also quite important that we recognize at the fundamental level what we are talking about when we talk about a continental free trade agreement. In many ways, it's really simple, very simple. If I buy something from Africa, it should cost me less than if I bring it from outside Africa. The principle of tariffs. How much do I pay to bring in the produce from Nigeria instead of from India? or from South Africa instead of from China. At that basic level, the belief is that if AFTA was to succeed, 90% of all the products that we sell within the region, if they are coming from Africa, they will attract no duty. We are going to allow 7% of those products to continue to attract duty for a bit longer, for about 13 years for the countries that are less developed, and about 10 years, I think, for those that are a bit more developed, like Ghana. And then there are three of them, 3% of the products that for national security reasons and the rest of it, we can exclude from the after regime. In, in, in the most basic sense, that's what we are really talking about. Removing duty from the products and finding out a way to establish that something was actually made in Africa so that it would benefit from duty-free access. Most of the other technical complexities dissolve in the face of that degree of simplicity. After is based on this notion of improving the quality and the strength of demand. The idea is that if you create a larger market by saying that you know the whole of the continent is one market, and regardless of where you produce the item, as long as it's trading within Africa, it's going to attract duty-free access. If you do that, the belief is you're going to create demand for better infrastructure and policies. Because if I'm able to bring produce at a lower cost from other African countries, I'm going to be worried the road is not made. I'm going to be worried if the airport is not done. We know, though, that that's not as simple as it sounds for the simple reason that in our part of the world, sometimes the stakeholders that are involved in these kind of things, let's say the trading community, are not as influential as the political communities. So whether or not the fact that we make a lot of money as a business community from a particular highway would drive policy action compared to whether or not the communities that live there vote for the party in power is a question that the political scientists will have to answer. But they believe is that if we create a big enough community within the continent that have a strong stake in trade because they are making money due to the fact that they are getting the products for cheaper, then hopefully they will force the policymakers to invest in the infrastructure that will enable them to make more money. That would then lead to obviously a demand for better policy. So if, for instance, I get to the border and I was told that you know, I should be able to get my produce through in three hours, but it's not happening, maybe I'll call some radio stations and make noise. Maybe I'll write, I'll get my, uh, my uh, business um, um, stakeholder group 
to publish a paper, and that will put pressure. The belief in demand-driven improvements is very important because if you don't keep that in mind, we're going to find out that we've been here before. There are already eight groupings in Africa, including the one that we are in, ECOWAS, where some of this stuff I'm talking about is already supposed to be happening, and apparently has been happening for years. ECOWAS was founded in what, 75? So theoretically, we've been doing this for more, maybe 15 years, nearly 50 years. Do we feel that ECOWAS is a single market? We've had Nigeria lock their border or close their border to Benin for years now, maybe three years. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is, if we've had these groupings already, censored, IGAD, all of these groups where within that territory, we are supposed to have duty-free access. And so produce are supposed to enter. We've even had an attempt to group some of these existing groups into a bigger one, what you see on the, on the right, the TTFA, which covers a significant part of Africa. Most of Southern, Eastern, and a good part of North Africa is already covered under the TTFA. And rules are supposed to be designed, are supposed to make trading within that region even freer. So the question is, what is it about the AFTA that fundamentally changes the game? Primarily, it's about the narrative. The fact that somehow it seems as if we finally come to the conclusion that unless we do this and do it properly, we're not going to be able to develop. I think there's a new narrative, a new agency that we better get it fixed. I also think that it's a simpler story. Equus is a bit complicated. You know, we've got eight regional economic communities and they intersect in some way and we've got competing rules of origin rules and we've got competing um, uh, tariff schedules and some of it's just too complicated for a lot of people to grasp. And just saying that we have a single market across the continent is a much more compelling narrative to force all of us to look at this in a more critical fashion. I think that's what is primarily different. And more people, I think, over time, across the continent, will know and understand after than they would their local regional economic community, except in places like EAC, where they have in, in historically really been seen as one homo, uh, contiguous unit, less so in ECOWAS and other places. So that is a very compelling point. I think if you ask anybody who has been in this space for a little bit, and you ask them, what are we really trying to solve here? The one fundamental thing they will keep pointing out is fragmentation. Africa is too fragmented. There are too many countries. They are too small. Everything is too, you know, polarized. It's so hard to get to navigate, you know, language barriers, etc., etc. And the belief is somehow we have to end fragmentation. I'm not going to dispute that fact that fragmentation is an issue, but the truth of the matter is that when you think of the after situation in pharmaceuticals, at least, we already have something that looks like consolidation in many respects. It's not as fragmented as it looks. This is the picture of pharmaceutical manufacturing on the continent. And as you can see, there are about four or so countries that, for the most part, manufacturing is happening. Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, um, South Africa. If you look at it very carefully, and all you are looking at is basically the parts where you see a deeper shade, they have more than 50 pharmaceutical companies. The lighter it is, the fewer the pharmaceutical companies. So Ghana has, in the region of you know, almost 50 companies, pharmaceutical companies that manufacture locally, serious manufacturing. But um, you look at the rest of the continent, there's almost, no, I mean, sub-Saharan Africa. There is very little manufacturing going on. Some countries have no manufacturing entity at, facility at all, including some of the big countries. So there's a lot of consolidation already. And in the pharmaceutical space, it's not as fragmented as you might think. There's a bit more deeper in terms of trying to look at the manufacturers uh, in the region. And this is not just Sub-Saharan Africa, this is the whole continent. So you can see Egypt and the rest also popping up. The other thing that I also think is very critical is the degree to which local ownership of pharmaceutical manufacturing is prevalent compared to some other sectors of the economy. A lot of the pharmaceutical manufacturing that goes on in the continent is being driven by local capital, not a lot of multinationals, etc. You can see the a very significant chunk of local manufacturers on the right side. So it makes, it, ma it makes pharmaceutical an interesting segment because we've often talked about the fact that too often we are, in the, we are subject to the whims of international capital. This is one area where there's a lot of significant local capital driving manufacturing. The other thing that, and following the same team, is important is the nature of the organization of the industries. 
the way that in Ghana, for instance, PMAG and the others organize. Even here, you see significant concentration in some parts of, of, the, of the continent, as in understanding that we have one industry and we have a common strategy, having uh, industry associations that drive that strategy, etc. You see a lot of activity in Ghana, Nigeria, and West Africa. Much of Francophone Africa, not a lot of activity. In short, I'm trying to establish the fact that we have enough consolidation that we'll be able to make progress without waiting for the entire continent. And this is a point that I'll keep re referring to. Here, even up to product level, you'll be surprised at the degree of concentration. You are looking at, uh, uh, let me just uh, try and explain this a little bit. What, what they are saying is that if you take pain and analgesics in Zambia, for instance, 100% of supply is by one company. And there are a lot of categories of medicines from 80, 9 to 1% of all antihypertensives being provided by a single producer in Zambia, for instance. And this gives you an idea that if we really wanted to move forward, we don't need everybody. Just a few significant players can make a huge impact because of the concentration, which is not something that we often talk about. Because of the feeling that there's a lot of fragmentation, the senses, oh, it's just too hard to, to organize and to coordinate. Actually, it's not that quite fragmented when you look carefully at the pharmaceutical industry in Africa. The other point that I think is also significant is that some of the regions are already well ahead. If you take EAC, almost 30% of imports of pharmaceuticals come from the region. It's small for ECOWAS, just 5.6%. But if one region on the continent is already able to get almost 30% of its medicines from within its own region, that's a lot of encouragement, huge encouragement. So my, my simple point, or my first point, I have only two key points to make. My first point is that we don't have to wait for every single country from Eritrea, which has not even signed the agreement, all the way to Ghana, which is enthusiastic about hosting the headquarters, to f you know, figure it out. We can't wait. There will be parts of the continent where the leadership is ready, the business community is ready. They have to take up the flag and kick off. So that's my key point. That notwithstanding, there are a few other details that I think are necessary for this conversation. I'll go through them pretty quickly, given that my time is short. Regulatory harmonization is interesting. And for those of you that are in the pharma sector, you probably will list as one of the key issues. The fact that it takes so long to register medicine in each market, and you have to do it from you know, country to country is a big problem. In, there are some countries like Angola where it takes you almost two years to medicine, medi register medicine. If you can do a central approach, like in Europe, it's actually quicker to do it regionally than in the countries. Because regionally, we have uh, community law that says that you must get a registration done in 90 days. Registration simply means, for those of you that are not in the pharma sector, the government says your medicine that you want to sell, I've looked into it, it's fine, you can start selling. That's really what we mean by registration. And in some places, as I've shown you on the map, it takes as much as two years for the government uh, agency responsible. Here we have the FDA to go through that process of doing that registration process. So that is very significant. If we can have a situation as they have in Europe, where you can register centrally, you have a European Medicines Agency, and then it applies unless there's objection to the, in the different uh, jurisdictions, and you could do it for 90 days, then we could have a huge impact. That's why it's so expensive in Europe, because one, not only is the market significant, so if you're spending 200,000 euros to register one drug in Europe, it makes sense because the market is so huge, and on top of that, it's highly integrated. At least we should fix that problem, making it possible now that the AMA is here, the African Medicines Agency, to try and see how we can quickly introduce harmonization in registration. I must mention, though, that this has, there has been an improvement. Some of the major countries like Ghana and the rest have really done very well to boost, boost the capacity of their regulatory institutions so they can register this quicker. I think Ghana now, if you are lucky, you can do it in about six months. So there have been improvements. There are still issues. But I'll say that compared to a few years ago, there have been improvements. The other initiative that I think is important to mention is that in the African Medicine Regulation Harmonization Initiative, there is what we call the Regional Centers of Regulatory Excellence, which we position in different parts of the continent to create an integrated structure for improving regulatory science in a fairly harmonized manner. The challenge, as some of you know, is that you know, we brought in academia and then we brought in um, regulators, some in industry, to try and create these centers. But the awareness within even the industries themselves about the activities of these regulatory centers of excellence is quite low. And we have to figure out how to you know, do better in that regard. In the case of pay setters, like I've said, we, shouldn't, we can't wait for everybody to get their act together. 
One area where we're missing significant progress is in using information technology. And in EAC, they already now have a harmonized central information management system for the entire region. All the five countries in the East Africa community, the, cent the EAC has a single electronic platform that is supposed to really advance registration of products, for instance. I think ECOWAS is far behind. The point is we don't have to wait for ECOWAS. Most pharmaceutical manufacturing in, in ECOWAS is Ghana and Nigeria. At the very least, NAVDAC and FDA should be able to create a single platform for product registration and for management of some of the key regulatory functions like adverse effect reporting and the rest. And the fact that EAC has done it, despite you know, having a smaller market, despite having you know, limited, more limited resources in the pharmaceutical sector and the rest, shows that it can be done. Though, of course, Tanzania is one of the countries that, together with Ghana, um, are WHO, are considered WHO um, compatible, WHO standards compatible. This is the, the, the big kahuna, the incoming African Medicines Agency. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail, but it's also taking a decade just to get it going. Things take a very long time in Africa if you want a lot of countries to agree. Here they needed, I think, 20 countries to ratify, and that has taken them up to a decade before you know, it's now more or less ratified and supposed to be enforced. Egypt is making a very strong push to host it. Rwanda is doing the same. My last big idea, and I'm almost through, is the fact that when it comes to pool procurement, a lot of the discussion in the continent has focused on the products, the consumable, what you consume. It's like, okay, why can't a few countries come together and then they procure it in, in, in common and that would help reduce the cost, et cetera, et cetera. I think we have to think beyond just the final consumable to the active pharmaceutical ingredients as well and to think whether or not we can use that kind of situation to really boost the ability of the continent's manufacturers to be cost competitive. The challenge is going to be donor issues. A lot of the products that we consume in some segments are completely donor do dominated. What, means is that, what that means is that international donors like the World Bank, uh, bilateral partners, Gavi and the rest, give those things to us for free, making it very difficult to compete if you're a manufacturer. Think of reproductive health. Most of our reproductive products, condoms and the rest in this country, are actually provided for free by international partners. So if you are manufacturing condoms in Ghana, you're going to lose money. It's just not possible. And there are a lot of areas like that, including even vaccination, where we have significant donations that come through Gavi and the rest that make it very difficult for you to compete as a private manufacturer. So we need to think through that. Sometimes the fact that the, donate, uh, the subsidy from the donor can bring something down from $28 to $3 is frightening for a business person to behold. So we need to think through how we do, we use this donor strategy in a more strategic basis because they do reduce the cost of medicines and make medicines available all these unicef gavi programs and the like and for some people without these subsidies they will not be able to afford medicines but to the extent that it can make it hard for a business person to get in that space we need to think whether or not these donor mechanisms can be redesigned and where our intellectual input into the redesign, like the way they did it for the medicines patent pool, the way they've done it for DNDI, drugs for neglected disease, industry comes together with donors, with government, and then they come up with something more innovative that address multiple interests. Very often, we don't participate enough. Industry is not talking enough to policy think tanks. So banks are not talking enough to pharmaceutical companies in their industry associations. They are not talking to think tanks. So we're not, we're not able to innovate, requiring, therefore, that things are either or. So it's either we are getting it for free, or we are making it and selling it at cost. But we can do smart things beyond that. Some countries, for instance, if you go to a country like Zimbabwe, they've used the donor system much more effectively. They use UNDP to do their procurement to cut out corruption. So some of those donor mechanisms can be interesting. And we don't have to throw the baby with the bath water by saying that because it makes certain things impractical, we should cut out the donor element because we cannot cut it out. People need cheap medicine to survive. My last point, we do need, when we think of this multi-stakeholder point that I'm making, industry working with think tanks, working with uh, government and the rest to create interesting solutions, to realize that if we don't do it, other people will do it for it and design it for us. You know the government of Ghana with Senegal and Rwanda are coming into a strategic initiative now to start producing vaccines. What most of you don't know is that almost every aspect of it was designed by a foundation in Europe called Kenup. Almost no input whatsoever of local industry. Very little input. And even as they build the National Vaccine Institute, from my checks, there's even, at this stage, 
limited input from local industry and other others in the stakeho uh, other stakeholders in the ecosystem into designing these things. So now they've decided that they're going to bring more or less a factory already designed or whatever, in export, put it on a ship and come and plant it here and make vaccines. We need vaccines. But the reason we need vaccines more than anything else is to build security into our supply system. Not just that we need the vaccine, otherwise you could just buy the vaccines. We need to be able to integrate the production into other aspects of our ecosystem so that people can supply nanolipids and other things that the vaccine manufacturers need. So we don't just need the vaccines for vaccine sake. So to build a factory in Germany or whatever, put it on a ship and come and dump it here and call it a modular model, when what you really mean is that you don't want to share intellectual property, it's problematic. The question is who designed these things? Already the politicians have received a lot of um, fav favorable um, PR from doing this. But the truth is, it, is not, it has not been done with the input of industry and the policy community in Ghana. And if we don't move up, we are not going to be able to build the innovations around the multi-stakeholder element that will make a big difference. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bright. And, and as usual, I mean, you wouldn't expect anything less from Bright Simmons, actually. Very stimulating, uh, looks at the issues from different angles. Thank you so much for setting the stage. And um, you made the point about um, the fact that the industry is, the pharmaceutical industry is not as fragmented as we think. And I remember that about in 2012 or so, the industry association in West Africa, East Africa, and Southern Africa came together and formed FAPMA. And that single association of manufacturing industries was the body that engaged the PMPA process, you know, and was coordinating all the inputs from the industry as a whole. So as of now, actually, you are right. Um, the financial industry in, in West, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa is so harmonized in terms of the, at the private sector level, they can easily reach uh, 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 them as well. And of course, you made the point about harmonization, which is, like the biggest headache for everybody, you know? I mean, why do I have to, and it's not even just about even paying different sums of money, but then also preparing, the cost of preparing different documentation for about 50 something countries. It's, it's not just to make sure the medicines are, are available to people. It's, it's a huge problem. Hopefully as we progress with AMA and all, we can deal uh, uh, with it. So thank you so much, thank you so much, Bright. I'd like to acknowledge the presence of a few people um, in our midst. And the first person I'd like to talk about is the Chief Executive Officer of the Ghana Chamber of Pharmacy, Mr. Anthony Ameka, who is in our midst today. <laughs> then we also have Dr. Farid Arthur, who is the National AFTA Coordinator. Uh, Dr. Farid Arthur is, is here in our midst. Um, we also have, so there's a, there's a group in Ghana, Palladium, uh, doing a lot of work in the pharma space and other areas as well. And Mr. Louis Norte happens to be the, the pharmaceutical sector lead for, for Palladium. Uh, Mr. Louis Norte has worked significantly also within the pharmaceutical manufacturing sector, advising, uh, working on behalf of UNIDO, advising the government of Ghana and other en entities on how we could progress so on, on pharmaceutical manufacturing. So his inputs, I'm happy you are here and your inputs will be really uh, 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 welcome. The next speaker for us is on policy. And we are we were supposed to have the Deputy Minister for Trade and Industry, who unfortunately is unable to make it. So he has sent uh, Kwesi Ofuri Arthur, Kwesi Ofuri Entry, who is the team leader, strategic anchor industries. And Kwesi will come and give us the policy perspective on what we are talking about. Shall we put our hands together for Kwesi? Good morning to you all. Um, as um, Kwabuna said, my deputy minister was supposed to be here, but um, a late call last night took him to Kumasi, so he couldn't be with us here. So he's asked me to make um, this statement on his behalf. Mr. Chairman, the managing director of Cal Bank, the representative of the Secretary General of the AFCFT Secretariat, Mr. Amaka, Captains of industry, distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. I want to express my appreciation to the organizers for putting up this platform
to discuss issues relevant for the development of one of the critical sectors of the global economy, which most economies were mainly looking up to during the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic, that's the pharmaceutical industry. As you may all be aware, all economies were looking up to the pharmaceutical industry to develop products to curb the ravaging COVID-19 virus. The industry during the period had to diversify the operations into producing, among others, sanitizers and other pharma products that could help reduce the effects of the virus on human life. In Ghana, the effect of pandemic could not be underestimated as it led to the disruption of supply chains for the various sectors of our economy, including the pharmaceutical industry, which relies mainly on the importation of active pharmaceutical ingredients for the production of pharmaceutical products. I wish to once again commend the local pharmaceutical industry for its resilience during the pandemic and providing the necessary support for the people of Ghana. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, the pharmaceutical industry is one of government's strategic anchor industries being developed as a new growth poles for industrial transformation. It is one of the industries under our national AFCFTA policy framework also being developed. In view of this, the government is embarking on the following initiative to, among others, create an enabling environment for the attraction of the needed investment into the industry. The one district one, one, the one, district one factory initiative is providing the following support measures. A waiver of import duties and levies on imported plants, plant, machinery, machine. equipment, as well as raw materials. A five-year corporate tax holidays for businesses under the initiative interest subsidies for loans granted to wholly Ghanaian-owned business. Under the Ghana Cares of Antapa program, a post-COVID-19 measure to support the revitalization of industries, the following are being undertaken. Upgrading of pharmaceutical companies to achieve the WHO Good Manufacturing Practices Standard, provision of management and technical assistance to enhance operational efficiency of selected tier two pharmaceutical companies. Three. The establishment of a bioequivalent center to support the local pharmaceutical manufacturing industry. Under the Ghana JET program, technical assistance is being provided for the following. The finalization of the draft policy and incentive framework for the pharmaceutical industry and the establishment of an active pharmaceutical in ingredient facility. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, let me emphasize that the ministry will continue to collaboratively work with the National Chamber of Pharmacy towards the establishment of the pharma pack at the Dawa Industrial Zone. Permit me to state that the government with support from the private sector is gradually taking giant steps towards making a world-class pharmaceutical manufacturing hub in the sub-region capable of locally producing and supplying the high quality, affordable, safe and efficacious medicines for domestic and export market, including taking advantage of the opportunities presented under the AFCFTA. I want to conclude by saying that the ministry together with the relevant state institutions will continue to promote cooperation with the, with the pharmaceutical industry for an efficient regulatory regime to turn Ghana into a vibrant pharmaceutical research and development and production hub in the sub-region. I wish us all a successful outcome and I hope that the outcome of this policy, of this information, of this discussion will inform policy. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Honorable Minister. So when you hear the, you know, for example, the, the policy initiatives that, that he presented, um, prior to coming here, when the panelists met Mr. Charles Fodjo, who will be speaking later on, we're, we're having a conversation around impact, right? That it looks like we've had, you know, little policy initiatives here and there. We've talked about a number of things, but, you know, we are still not getting to the point where things are actually happening. Like maybe we have five industries in Ghana, for example, which are world class, who are into exports, and for example, when COVID hit, we were part of the teams of companies that are really at the center of it. And I think that as we have this conversation, that is the kind of thinking that we should be having. What do we need to do within, within which timelines to get to that level? So maybe uh, uh, representing the Minister for, for Trade and Industry, in addition to the policies that you listed, we also want to see that what do we need to do and how do you lead a process that in the next, say, five years, we have five pharma industries in Ghana that are giants of pharma, pharma manufacturing across the continent. 
Thank you very much. So our next presentation is from India. I told you, I told you, I told you earlier on about India being the, the, the role model uh, when it comes to pharmaceutical manufacturing across the globe today. And as we, we learn, we also want to learn from them. And we are really highly honored to have uh, a presentation by the Director General of the, of the uh, Pharma Export Promotion Council of India. He's going to join us uh, virtually. And he's in the person of Mr. Udi Bas, Baskar. Um, and, 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 and Pharmaxil, which is the Pharma Export Promotion Council of India, is, is, a, is a very influential body in the Indian pharmaceutical industry. So it's really huge that we have him in our midst. And uh, I'll invite him to make his presentation uh, now. So you're welcome, Mr. Baskar. Can you hear us? Yes, yes. OK, please. Uh, thank you so much over. for your uh, good words about uh, India being a role model of uh, the pharmaceutical world. And uh, we appreciate your, um, the comments. At the outset, uh, um, uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, uh, I'm very much thankful to the Carl Bank as well as Ghana National Chamber of Pharmacy for inviting Pharmaxil to share our uh, experiences in the post-COVID uh, era. Uh, it, I, we always closely working with uh, Ghana uh, as a country, as well as the FDA and uh, the Ghana National Chamber of Pharmacy also. So just I would like to, for the convenience and for the information of the members, just I would like to uh, tell about uh, the Pharmaceuticals Export Promotion Council as well as our uh, the strengths and uh, how we manage the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, the Pharmaceuticals Export Promotion Council is a foreign trade policy by Government of India, Minister of Commerce and Industry. We have uh, more than 3,500 uh, uh, companies. So in the uh, we are popularly known as pharmacy of the world and uh, Indian pharma companies are exporting to more than 200 countries. And uh, our, uh, the major exports, 55% uh, of our exports are going to highly regulated markets and Africa is uh, our third largest exporting uh, the, the destination. The particularly, uh, I need not explain about uh, the journey of Indian pharmaceutical industry um, from 95% dependence to uh, now 95%, we can able to meet our domestic uh, needs and we're also supplying drugs to the entire, uh, entire um, the world. In the, uh, the pre-pandemic, uh, the, in the initial days of uh, the pandemic, uh, that is March, you know, in the last financial year of 1920, we, we exported 20.7 a billion US dollars worth of drugs to different parts of the world. And uh, the peak COVID period, particularly the 2021, um, we exported 24.469 uh, billion US dollars worth of drugs with 18% growth rate. When, uh, when the entire world is facing such a serious situation and the manufacturing sector is not doing well, at that point of time, India recorded 18% uh, growth rate. Um, uh, it's not only in terms of uh, the exports, we can able to meet our uh, domestic needs as well as we exported uh, uh, the drugs which are uh, used in the treatment of uh, COVID to um, the entire, uh, entire world. So that, uh, that, that has made uh, the, the entire um, world looking at India for uh, producing the quality and efficacious drugs at a very, very affordable price. We, we, we continued the same um, the journey in this financial year, 21-22 uh, also, we, 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 we exported 24.446 um, uh, billion US dollars worth of drugs. Africa is always a very important, uh, not only in terms of the business, and they, it's always a, an important to India uh, uh, um, the external affairs relations and people to people relations and uh, uh, we are uh, we are known for you know supplying uh, hiv tuberculosis and anti uh, virals and other other drugs to africa at a very very affordable price that was initiated by the indian companies like uh, uh, supply and all 
So particularly during the pandemic and post pandemic, uh, it was a big challenge to the world, uh, but uh, we, we uh, shifted the challenge and we have taken uh, the challenge as an opportunity. The Indian vaccine industry, uh, we, the vaccine industry is known for producing 65% uh, um, of the uh, requirement of vaccines. Our friend has also mentioned about it. But uh, we, we are uh, manufacturing the conventional uh, and uh, uh, vaccines used for the immunization programs. But this is the first time during the pandemic, Indian pharmacy, Indian vaccine industry uh, developed an indigenous vaccine for uh, COVID-19. That's a great uh, achievement and nobody expected that Indian Indians will develop a vaccine uh, to, the, to COVID within a shortest possible time on par with the, the developed world. So this, this has demonstrated that, you know, we have, we have, we have uh, uh, not only met the needs of our, uh, the people, we, 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 we also exported uh, the vaccines, uh, particularly to uh, almost 97 uh, countries and 170 million doses. So the the that that uh, uh, that always Indian pharmaceutical industry as well as uh, the particular the vaccine industry, I think nowhere in the world uh, such a huge number of uh, the vaccine industry is involved uh, in in agreement with uh, different uh, foreign agencies or the research institutions and the pharma vaccine companies to develop vaccines or uh, and. Uh, in collaboration with them, and we also ramped up our uh, our um, uh, the 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 capacities. So in India, um, uh, it, um, we have given 186 crore doses uh, and 83.8 uh, uh, crore population is um, uh, vaccinated, and uh, and 60.7 percent is also. Uh, uh, of Indian population of 140 crores are vaccinated. Here, the, the, um, we observed that, uh, my, my close observation, uh, particularly the countries who have money and the countries who have the knowledge and the science and the people who are developing had the vaccines, but most of the countries uh, who are unprivileged and particularly the Africa and some other countries are not having the privilege of uh, having this COVID vaccine. So the, as the, uh, in the initial speaker has rightly mentioned about uh, the Africa's dependence on uh, the, the vaccines, 90% they are importing. And uh, so this is the area where, uh, the, where uh, the, we can uh, think about uh, the collaboration with the Indian, Indian um, vaccine manufacturers. And uh, the, we, we, we need to work very uh, closely in, in, in understanding the problems of each other and uh, uh, the most of the undeveloped countries and the developing countries in India have more or less the same problems. So, but uh, this, this is the uh, opportunity we should make use of it and uh, uh, that, that is going to help uh, the, the, uh, not only uh, the, um, the pharmaceutical industry and also more uh, in addressing the issues of the people of uh, both the countries. So I, uh, with this, uh, I, I, Pharmaceuticals Export Promotion Council of India uh, is uh, coordinating and uh, giving support to the Ghana National Chamber of Pharmacy and we're also supporting in that uh, the cluster, uh, the, the, the program. And we also work very closely with uh, Africa Continental Free Trade Area and uh, Call Bank in facilitating uh, the, the, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, uh, Africa in general and Ghana in uh, specific. Uh, in the last financial year also, we, we, uh, we uh, uh, exported the 167.21 million US dollars worth of drugs to Ghana with 57.70% of growth. So my, my interaction with the, um, with the uh, FDA Ghana CEOs a couple of times uh, in 2016 and 2019, 
the FDA is one of the strongest, uh, um, the Ghana is very strongest organization. And uh, so the, uh, but in particular the South Africa and the Nigeria, these are the, uh, the role models uh, the, the other African uh, countries can take. And uh, so we have also proposed one of, in, in this presentation, he is also talking about the harmonization of uh, the, the, the regulators. So we, Pharmaxil is very keen in uh, pushing that agenda forward and uh, we organized international uh, regulators meet in 2019 and we are proposing for international regulators meet and uh, uh, business meetings in uh, 2022. So uh, I, I, I think uh, this kind of uh, discussions and uh, this kind of an initiative from uh, the Cal Bank and the uh, Ghana National Chamber of Pharmacy is going to be helpful. With this, uh, I'm once again, uh, on behalf of uh, the members of Pharmaceuticals Export Promotion Council of India, once again, I, I, I thank the organizers uh, for organizing this program. And we are always open to the organizers in, uh, in, in uh, working uh, very closely with them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Director General. So our next presentation is from Mr. Charles Fodjo, who is going to share with us the experiences of a Ghanaian entrepreneur. And the unique thing about Charles is that Charles, you know, for the initial part of his career worked extensively with the international biopharmaceutical industry, specifically Roche, and he did a fantastic job in Ghana at the regional level and then on the continent before he retired. And then now, he is into you know, starting his own business with a vision of playing ultimately in the entire value chain. And we want to know how, Charles, how that is going and what your perspectives are on the topic that we are sharing. And hopefully later on, I'll, I'll kind of bring you into the conversation as to how we can leverage the biopharmaceutical industry to the conversation that we are trying to have now. So ladies and gentlemen, shall we please invite Charles Fodjo. Thank you. Um, before COVID, I would have said um, I was, uh, I would have been feeling ashamed standing here with all that I've learned in the world, uh, selling medicines across Africa on behalf of a foreign uh, company. But now, after COVID, I'm happy to see the learnings that we've gained working in the corporate world and down the energy that has come into Africa as to they need to do something different, to tell the story of how we need to do it. Before I go there, I want us to uh, pick some few learnings in the pharma industry uh, that we have we, we picked from uh, COVID that African can leverage on for this discussion. In the, in the, in the, in the first uh, case, we, we, we have come to realize that the pharmaceutical industry is a national security issue. When COVID happened, you can see what happened in the early days of COVID, in the early uh, 2020s. Every country stopped the export of critical medicines and left it for their key people. When we heard that uh, alcohol sanitizer, alcohol-based sanitizers were what we were used to, to prevent the spread of the COVID, what happened? No single country was exporting. So every country had to think about itself. Critical medicines like med, uh, diabetes, hypertension, our good friends in uh, India and things limited the exportation of the APIs and those ones to rightfully take care of their own people. So COVID told us that if you are not producing enough to take care of yourself, the next one, the next pandemic happens, you will be found wanting again. And then you have to be self-sufficient Gone are the days when the developed world, like the um, America and the Europe, thought that they want to focus on finishing, doing the finished product. So they decentralized and asked China and uh, Vietnam and India to be doing APIs for them. Then they'll go and collect the APIs and assemble them in America. Then COVID came and now all the APIs were limited. They were kept in China, they were kept in India, then they've learned their lesson. So now, they will also be doing APIs so that from end to end, when the next COVID happens, they will not have to rely on anybody again. And then we realized that 
Pharma is a big business. Big business. Big business in the sense of when the science was saying that vaccine is going to be the solution, there was a big race in the world as to who will produce the first vaccine. And that is where uh, the countries that have been investing in R&D, like the America, the UK, they went to academia to look, to dust the books and look at who is having something that is closest to the, to the closest vaccine. And because John, Johnson & Johnson has been in vaccine industry for a long time, because AstraZeneca had, be, had also the, the technology and from GSK instead of how to do vaccines already. And because Germany and America had mRNA technology, they could quickly upscale. And then they picked it up and then they asked the rest of the world to say, if you want the solution in the vaccine, put your money at, ahead, put money on the table. Then they all gave their money to the, to the Pfizer's, to the biotechs, and then they produced the vaccines for the world. I'm curious to see the financial of Pfizer and Astra. Huge profits, huge, because they saw pharmaceutical as, as, a, pharm uh, as, a, as a source of business. As we sit here now, the pharma industry in ECOWAS region, where you pull us together, is about five billion. I'm yet to see the amount of cocoa we need to export to make five, five billion dollars. And that, that I'm yet, yet to see the, what we need to export in Ghana to make five billion. And as Bright White showed, when you look at the map, apart from Nigeria, the only competitor for us in ECOWAS is, is uh, Nigeria. That the five billion is out there for us to take. So pharma is a big business, far bigger than all the things that we're talking about as our national initiative, Mr. Trade uh, Industry. So pharma industry is a big business, and it is a source of national pride. It's a source of big pride. When there was a point point of who was going to create the solution for vaccine, America wanted to be the first. Germany wanted to be the first. They assembled their scientists and they assembled their people. They were not sleeping. They wanted to be the first. And that is why you see that America fast-tracked the process for drug registration to and relaxed the processes to make sure that Pfizer crossed the line, Johnson & Johnson crossed the line, Germany did the same thing, and our good, good brothers in Germany, uh, India also did the same for their Indian companies. And then you ask yourself in all this, what did we do? The president did his part. He called captains of industry into, into uh, Jubilee House and asked us, what can we do for them? And then we, pharma, pharma industry promised that we will, we will try to produce a sanitizer. FDA came out with a harmonized solution, simplified formula, so that we can produce the sanitizer for Ghana. And then before we realized the alcohol industry had turned into sanitizer producers. And therefore, at the end of the day, the revenues that were going to be made to, to build the industry went back to alcohol industry and pharma industry where, where they don't, because the politicians do not buy the sanitizer from pharma industry. They bought it from the alcohol industry instead of from the pharma industry. So we are left off. We could not make that revenue that we could use to build the industry. And then also, when we, we all, the whole world, anytime we hear about what can be used to, to manage COVID, hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine, whatever. We are all battling to see who will be the first one to do. Captains of industry in Ghana said, we will do it. Local industry went and imported raw materials to produce hydroxychloroquine. Just because the science moved, government did not buy from them again, and they were sitting on the raw materials and all those things, and then they were they are worse off. So fast track it to say that lessons have been learned. COVID is gone. The pharma industry in Ghana do not make enough revenue to build on it for the way forward. But the key lesson learned is that what the success story of India, the success story of America, as a pharma, what this pharma industry did is here. So some of us are very, very happy that Carl Bank is taking this initiative. We don't need, we don't need to wait for policy makers or anybody to come and put money on the table for us. We have the know-how, we have the people. We want to, to say that by the time we live here, if we want to make the next Pfizer, if we want to make the next rush, that will go in. We can do it. Pakistan, Pakistan had overnight, because of the scarcity of medicine, Pakistan pharma industry has, uh, uh, has more than uh, multiplied fivefold 
by via export. Sri Lanka, the same thing. You heard what our colleagues in India said. 27 billion of exports. The industry is there for the taking. The human resource is there to, for there to be there. Let's come together and think and say, we will make more money from the pharma industry than thinking about the next uh, automobile industry that you are financing. The same thing, whether we will make far money in the pharma industry than what you think about financing cocoa export and the, the jute sack. There's more money in pharma than that. I'll leave it at that. When we get to the uh, Q&A, uh, we we'll talk about it. Thank you, Charles. You know, when you sit in, um, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So when you sit in these meetings and you hear the presentations by the experts from pharma, you, you begin to wonder, why is this thing not happening tomorrow? Or why didn't it happen yesterday? You know, and I think that really, I mean, this should be the last talk shop. Okay, it's not a talk shop. This is the, it should be the last conference. The next time we are here, we shouldn't be cow and, and the MD is here. We, we don't want to talk about this is what we need to be doing. This is what we, we have to come and talk about this is what we have done, and this is the result of what we are done. And we are setting the ball uh, for the next level of development. Thank you so much for that perspective, uh, uh, Mr. Fodjo. Now, I met a, a beautiful lady um, doing, at, the, at the time when we were, we were preparing to come to, to this meeting. She's, she's called um, Justina. And um, Justina is the group head of the pharma sector in the post-COVID era corporate for Car Bank. Um, okay, maybe I, I got it wrong. Oh, group head for corporate. Is that, is that it? Okay, yeah, group head for corporate, Justina. And, and so when she came to interact with us, she was very, you know, simple, down to earth. And then somebody else came and said that, oh, that's, that's the boss. I was quite surprised because traditionally, I don't expect bosses to be that down to earth, you know. Um, so Justina is going to talk, talk to us about the role that Cow Bank is also thinking of playing or has been playing in this sector and how we can also uh, leverage on that, what, what, what they would also offer to be able to carry this conversation forward. So ladies and gentlemen, shall we put our hands together for Justina? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and I'll stand on all protocols. Now that my new name is Madame COVID, um, <laughs> I actually like it. <laughs> anyway, so um, the reason why, when we sat um, in the room, he asked me, why this really? What's the bother for Carl? Um, what is all this about? Why do you think you should bother to bring all of these industry players here? Um, and my first answer was that we want to grow in indigenous businesses um, because we are indigenous. Um, and we want to walk the talk. So we've already signed an MOU with the Chamber of Pharmacy to support the Dawa Industrial Park um, project and to support members of, of the Chamber we are a very innovative bank. Um, you talked about the amphitheater we are sitting in. Um, we want to be part of that story. So um, in my research, I found out that the Serum Institute of India was established in 1966. And when COVID came, it, it came in very handy. Some of us were vaccinated from um, AstraZeneca vaccines that were produced in that institute. Cal Bank wants to be part of that relevant story. Develop maybe those five um, institutions that when the need arises will show um, that they can be ahead of the curve. Um, the other thing is we have many partners and we felt that this would be a nice common marketplace where all partners come in um, and benefit from each other. Then, as an institution, lastly, we want knowledge. Um, you can only proffer solutions to somebody when you understand what their problems are. And in the light of my new name, COVID, um, you know it's essential that you understand what the industry players are doing, what is important to them, so that you can proffer 
solutions that are, like we like to say in Cowbank, tailor-made. So that's really why we brought you here today. Now, um, just a little about who Cowbank is. Um, So um, Carl Bank, one of, one of the um, resource people, panelists, actually mentioned that, no, it was Mr. Arthur. This was continental acceptances. Yes, it was. Um, and we have metamorphosed into Carl Bank PLC, established in 1990. Um, and now we're Carl Bank PLC um, and listed proudly on the Ghana Stock Exchange one of the few institutions that have listed, not tried to pull back, and on an annual basis, paid dividends. So, um, like we were told, also very profitable. Now, um, just a bit about who Calbank is um, in numbers. We have 33 branches um, in Ghana. We're a local bank, like I mentioned. In seven regions now, we have quite a few ATMs, 103 of them, that allow um, people to transact, not necessarily at our branches. We have 850 professional staff, um, significantly almost 50% female, and we have three wholly owned subsidiaries. You see the catwalk, those are the key players in Calbank, that's a management team. And as I mentioned, our mission is to be an innovative and customer-focused bank, providing bespoke financial services and value to our stakeholders. We're mostly owned um, by SNIT, which is the National Pension Fund. Um, Arise BV is a fund not in Ghana, but um, other people own the rest of it. So majority owned Ghanaian, but like I said, indigenous in our makeup. So we have some key partners, like I mentioned, this is a marketplace. Um, and for us, we have significant key partners that we want to bring to the fore. So um, we play with the Chamber of Pharmacy. You see the logo in the middle. We have the likes of Ghana Exim Bank. And I'll tell you why for us, Ghana Exim Bank is um, significant. And then um, the other financial institutions that I have called correspondent banks. But we play with all the commissions because we want to build stakeholder knowledge. And so that's why uh, we call them strategic partners. So now why Calbank? We have a bit of pharmaceutical industry expertise. We've worked with some huge pharmaceutical companies. Um, I didn't sign an NDA with them, so I don't know if it's okay to mention their names. But at least um, rest assured, we've dealt with a couple of them and we know why it's essential that we go through this exercise. Um, and we're looking at the full supply chain. So um, we deal with everyone, the retail, the SMEs, the corporates, the large corporates, and then we deal with the regulator as well, um, just to make sure that we provide you what you need in the right form. We have quite a strong balance sheet, um, year on year, registering some healthy profits for all stakeholders, especially the shareholders. And we're proud to say we're local content. Um, like I said, significantly owned by Ghanaians. Now, for this sector, um, my, okay, we started a new policy. So Philip O um, actually mentioned that Calbank has a Cal Pharma scheme, which is a product that we have for SMEs, um, where we've structured it, we understand your working capital needs and we make sure that we provide you with a product that meets the needs um, in the absence of all those payments that need to come from national health insurance and all those um, other receivables that are due you. Um, we like manufacturing facilities. Um, we're proud to be part of some of the manuf manufacturing facilities owned by pharmaceutical companies in Ghana. Um, and so these are products we want to help you in manufacturing. Actually, we have a desk that sits um, with our corporate and institutional banking departments. That just focuses on manufacturing. Um, 
we want to, like we have grown and listed on the Ghana Stock Exchange, come and help other institutions that are indigenous take advantage of the continental free trade area. Um, we already have a desk that is set up, um, and Abna told me she was proud of us, so she will give us even more help. Um, we set up that desk. Anyone who wants to export um, can come to CAL. We'll tell you what the requirements are to be a member of this and benefit from the continental free trade area. Um, we partner with many institutions, so Development Bank of Ghana, 1D1F, um, that's Ministry of Trade, Ghana Exim Bank, and all these allow you to be entitled to concessionary um, price facilities. So we may charge you 20% for a facility, but if it's a 1D1F facility, the cost to your business is about 10%, because then the other 10% is taken on by the government of Ghana. And so, because we know all these things, when you walk to Cal, we can give you an idea of some of the things you can take advantage of to reduce your expenses and your costs significantly and make sure your products or your projects are viable. We have many online payment platforms. And the joy is that most of these are built in-house. And so we listen to you, we understand your need. And our favorite phrase, we tailor make these to suit you um, and your um, clientele base. Um, project finance, something that we enjoy doing. And so um, we can just pick that project. It may be Greenfield, but if you can demonstrate that this is a venture that will be beneficial, not a social project though. Um, we try and support you to make sure your project is successful. Like I said, we're looking at the full value chain. So your staff members walk to you and say, can I have um, advance for my salary so that at the end of the month you can take it out of my salary. And that is the company's working capital. You can leave CalBank to provide you or your staff with those salaried loans so that at least you can use your working capital for the right purposes. Now some So I'm going to talk about some key things that we um, believe are essential for okay. So we believe are essential for you to um, be able to access funding. Um, demand certainty is one of the big things, and some of the panelists have alluded to that. Um, we were talking about how we all thought that um, hydro, was it hydroxychloroquine was going to be useful for curing COVID. Um, if I were a bank and I financed that, you'd see there would be that issue of now I have a lot of stock, I'm unable to get rid of the stock. So for us, you need to be able to establish some demand certainty. Um, so that then it becomes easier for us to look at doing business together. The strength in regulatory environments you've spoken to, so I won't um, speak too much about, but for us, if you don't have a product that has been certified, if FDA hasn't given you the right approvals, and you come and say, CalBank, support me to bring in this product, we may be willing to do that LC because it gives us income. What if all your products are seized by the FDA? So... Um, talent and know-how is one of the key ones. Are we building um, experts locally who understand some of these biomedical things and are willing to do the research so that we have quite innovative products on the market, even though we will also want to establish that, look, these are relevant products that the market can benefit from. Um, then... I remember a comment that when the National Institute for um, the National Vaccine Institute was coming up, all the discussions were held offshore. Um, and now it's like a modular um, factory that is going to be put here. It all goes into the talent and know how. Um, and whether we're brave enough to want to be innovative enough and stop the buying and selling. Because typically, when you buy and sell, you know what your margins are from day one. 
Um, but you can do it differently. And we have a client who always says that when you do work, you get a profit. Um, you make money. But when you are innovative, then you make a profit, something to that effect. But um, the key one on this slide is actually the access to funding. We talk about come to Carl, we want to do business with you. Sometimes people walk in here with absolutely no documentation. You have to start putting your documents in the right place. Know how much you're buying, know how much you're selling, keeping the right records so that it makes it easy for us to be able to support you, um, make the most of your businesses. Um, your registration documents, are you following the right processes? Then, like I said, our partnerships with the likes of 1D1F, Ghana Cares, um, and that has been mentioned, so I won't talk too much about those. Then come into the four, or come to the four, and then they help us support you to become successful. So, um, I'm sure during the panelist discussion, because I got some questions from our um, MC, I'm sure they'll come up during the panel discussion, um, but I, I hope nobody will ask me about price because we are in very uncertain times, and um, he did ask me about pricing. Um, we are in uncertain times, but we try to remain below the market, um, typically when it comes to lending to key sectors that we as a bank have targeted, and the pharmaceutical sector is one of the ta target markets that the bank has, and in doing that, we grow capacity of our staff, set up desks that can play with um, players in these sectors, and just make sure we understand it enough so that we can provide you the right solution. So I'll stop here. Um, we want you to journey forward together with us. Um, we'll be happy to learn from you, and then we'll provide you with as much support as the institution can. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Justine. And um, that clearly tells us how we can uh, leverage on Carlback. And, and I think that this, um, this presentation that she made, and maybe we can build on, it, build on it a little bit more, should be made also to the, we'll explore how we can make it available to the entire pharmaceutical uh, society of Ghana, um, because other people may benefit from it. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to acknowledge the, the presence of Mr. Harrison Abutiati. Dr. Abutiati is a, it's a legendary pharmacist and also the chairman of the Ghana Chamber of Pharmacists. Thank you so much. Ghana um, Chamber of Pharmacy, National Chamber of Pharmacy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Justina, for the presentation as well. Um, so the next presentation is on the AFCF, a representative of the AFCFTA itself, after. And we have the presence of Mr. Prudence. Prudence, I'd like to leave it there. Um, so, and, uh, you are, your people call you Philip. Oh, wow. Okay, so I, I want to say it. So Philip is sitting next, next to Philip, and Philip is the MD of Carl Bank. You know, how many times can you call your boss by his first name? <laughs> and so I want to also call you Prudence. So Prudence is from the um, AFTA, and he is also going to share with us um, the, and he is the technical advisor to the Secretary General and he's going to share with us um, the AFCFTA's role uh, in this whole conversation that we are trying to have. So, Prudence, you're welcome. Is it on? Okay. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. I noticed that some are following us online, so uh, you might be in the afternoon. Uh, I will stand on the protocols that have been established uh, by uh, those who spoke before me, uh, and I think that's the beauty of, uh, of speaking last. 
Um, I also uh, don't have much to say because almost everything has been said. Especially uh, when I followed uh, the presentation by Bright, um, when Dr. Charles spoke, uh, you could see that you can't add anything. They have spoken, they have said everything. Uh, but because I'm here not on my own behalf, I'm here on behalf of uh, His Excellency Swam Kele Mene, uh, the Secretary General of African Continental Free Trade Area, I will have to make a statement on his behalf. And this will not be my statement, it will be his statement. Um, he requests me first to apologize on his behalf. Uh, he would have wished to be here with us. Unfortunately, he had other commitments. He traveled, he's not around. And um, he requests me to tell you that he's very happy uh, that uh, this event is taking place um, for a number of reasons. Number one reason, a pharma industry is one of the priority industries on the continent. It's one of the four key industries that have been identified. Um, if you look at all the studies that have been done uh, in terms of which are the priority sectors that the continent should uh, focus on, uh, pharmaceutical industry is among those four. So um, this uh, forum was the most important forum he would have wished to address um, at this occasion. He also requests me to extend his appreciation to uh, the managing director of Carl Bank uh, for this invitation and also the entire leadership of the, of the bank uh, for taking the lead um, in this uh, very important um, uh, sector. And um, he requests me to focus um, my talk on the opportunities that the FCFTA will offer to the pharmaceutical industry. The FCFTA is big. The FCFTA is about um, the entire market of the continent. The FCFTA is about more than 5,000 products that are traded on the continent, but he requests me to focus on pharmaceutical products, and especially um, the sector in Ghana. You might know that the pharmaceutical sector in Africa, and for that matter in Ghana, uh, has become critical, especially uh, given the circumstances with the COVID-19 pandemic as the continent struggled uh, with the limited access to COVID vaccines. The pandemic highlighted Africa's vulnerability uh, due to its reliance on imports for most vaccines, medicine, and other health products uh, that um, my colleagues have mentioned. And according to research, uh, recent uh, study by UNECA the United Nations Economic Commission has revealed that we import, as Africa, about 94% of our pharmaceutical and medical medicinal needs from outside the continent. And this can cost us up to 16 billion US dollars. I think you could see that from the statistics that uh, Bright uh, has projected. That's a reality, but at the same time, that's an opportunity for, for us who are here um, to invest uh, in that sector. And across the continent, this is our common reality, and the national circumstances may only differ in degree. So it's not about one country, it's about uh, almost all African countries. And in Ghana, the data shows that about 70% of pharmaceutical demands is made is met by imports, mostly from India, China, with local production accounting for the remaining 30%. So 70% of all the pharmaceutical products that are consumed here in, 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 in Ghana, they are coming from outside the continent. So only um, you who are here, I believe, contribute uh, 30%. Again, this is another challenge to you. Uh, to do much better. And this reliance on imported pharmaceuticals 
placed Africa in unsafe position to access essential medical supplies, not to mention the impact on the secondary pharmaceutical manufacturing within Africa. And we have seen this, of course, during um, COVID pandemic. There is now wide recognition that developing a robust local drugs industry will support local economies, create jobs, encourage research, and boost access to medical uh, medicines in the event of disease. Today, we see a surge in pharmaceutical companies uh, seeking to establish themselves on the continent to supply medicines and other vital uh, health technologies. I think um, someone said that even if we see opportunities in some African countries to uh, put up the centers of production, who is behind that initiative? They are still foreign companies. Again, that's another challenge that is put forward uh, to us. Why we expect the disruption brought about uh, by COVID-19 pandemic to resolve and economic and trading activities normalized this year? Ghana and other African countries will therefore need to strengthen intra-African supply chains, enhance resilience, and improve the infrastructure and health systems. I'm aware of the efforts that the government of Ghana um, has put in place to boost pharmaceutical um, manufacturing industry. Uh, we could see it from the previous uh, uh, presentations. And the FCFTA is going to offer a legally binding opportunity to the continent's countries to sharply focus on pharmaceutical manufacturing and industrialization of health. And a question will be how will the FCFTA um, um, offer that opportunity? I think um, someone mentioned uh, one of the organizations to be established, Africa Medical Agency, AMA. Of course, it has been established, uh, but it is not yet um, physically um, established. It has been legally established. Uh, it will contribute a lot to the regulatory frameworks of the sector. Um, without regulations, I think there is a lot that we cannot do in business. We will always be uh, disrupted. So the FCFT is going to establish a strong regulatory framework uh, for the pharmaceutical uh, sector. The FCFT will help make investment in Africa successful as it provides an opportunity for economies of scale, lack of which previously hindered pharmaceutical production in African countries. We are talking about economies of scale, why? Because um, when you look at how pharmacies and pharmaceutical products have been regulated globally, um, with the lack of our own intellectual property rights rules, we have always been dependent on imports from outside. Because big companies, big pharma companies have established themselves, they have positioned themselves to supply the whole world. Not because we don't have capacity, but because the rules don't allow us to um, invest in the sector. And we believe that FCFT is going to be the only opportunity for Africa to set our own rules, to make sure that we request those big companies to uh, give us a waiver. Uh, someone said, I think, Dr. Charles, that um, pharmaceutical products or pharmaceutical sector is a national security issue. So we can't rely on the outside world when it comes to national security. So we have to come up with our own rules, our own regulations, and know uh, how are we going to uh, produce and invest in this sector. That's what I was saying, that investing in pharmaceutical sectors will depend on enabling factors such as intellectual property rights, um, protection, regulatory approvals, uh, approval for new drugs, financing, among others, which are enabled by the FCFTA. One of the protocols of the African continental free trade area is the protocol on intellectual property rights. I wish that... Um, Next time when we have such a conversation, 
we should come up with a full list of what should be put in that protocol to make sure that investors in this sector are very well protected. And this FCFTA protocol on intellectual property rights will create a strong enabling environment for IP creation, protection, administration, and enforcement, which will stimulate innovation and competitiveness of the business sector. IPRs provide incentives to investors to develop new knowledge and the right to obtain a patent for an invention, for example, encourages the investment of money and efforts in research and development. The completion of ongoing negotiations among state parties will therefore help the key stakeholders to evaluate the relevant provisions for the healthcare and pharmaceutical value chains, particularly intellectual property rights and market access. For our African countries, the FCFTA will also offer an opportunity not only to restructure supply chains, but also catalyze the creation of regional value chains. We have to look at how can we put together our efforts and produce for the continent. There's one interesting provision which people don't um, maybe understand or don't take seriously. The FCFTA rules of origin. The FCFTA rules of origin provide for the principle of cumulation. The principle of cumulation means if you are producing in one of uh, 55 African countries, let's say Ghana, you have the right to outsource raw materials from the rest of 54 countries. And your product will qualify as made in Africa. So if you are setting up a factory here in Ghana and you can get raw materials from wherever in Africa, your product will still qualify as made in Africa. Your product will still qualify to be traded free, uh, duty free across the continent. And I don't think that products from outside the continent are going to compete you because you would have enjoyed uh, that freedom of not paying tariff duties. African countries can then um, leverage on the FCFTA to establish regional trade networks as well as global trade alliances. So we can have first to establish our regional uh, trade, ne uh, 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 trade networks that will bring together all those industries and um, uh, build a strong base. In the long term, it will enable African market to build a resilience in their supply chains, thus reducing our reliance on external markets and therefore act as a cushion against global economic shocks such as COVID-19 pandemic um, in the future. In support of the process of developing value chains for the continent and thus reducing its vulnerability to external shock, the FCFT Secretariat in collaboration with the partners, have launched initiatives in promoting industrialization in Africa through regional value chains as part of the implementation of the agreement. Uh, today we have identified um, four uh, key priority value chains, as I started saying, and pharmaceutical industry is one of them. Automotive industry is one of them. Agribusiness, is one of them, and transport and logistics is the other one. And all those four complement each other. So if uh, we look at them um, strategically and we tap into those opportunities, we are going to create up to 700,000 jobs for Africans. We are going to save the continent more than $40 billion that we are spending on imports. So uh, we have said that we are spending uh, almost $16 billion importing uh, pharmaceutical products. What if we can cut that by half? We are importing more than 35% billions of dollars in agricultural products. What if we can cut half of that? About $19 billion we are importing 
on autom automobiles from outside the continent. Africa has a lot of opportunities if you look at them uh, from a strategic point of view. With this uh, private sector engagement plan that we, uh, we, we are developing, we hope that uh, investors are in a better place to make sound decisions on where to invest, to seize the FCFT opportunities, including in the pharmaceutical sector. These are the quick wins that we need to prioritize for the implementation of the FCFT to be successful and help reduce Africa's over-reliance on imports and stimulate intra-African trade. To conclude my remarks, I don't want to uh, take long. I know uh, business people don't like speeches, I was told. So uh, before coming here, I was not even supposed to read a speech. I was told that business people, they want facts straightforward. They don't want to listen to speeches. Um, I would like to um, emphasize that the FCFTA provides opportunities for the development of the continental health industry. It has the potential to boost the manufacturing and trading of pharmaceuticals on the continent. To ensure our efforts are successful, there is need for a change in mindset and attitudes on the continent towards made in Africa products. We have to start thinking made in Africa, made in Africa. I know um, in, the, in, in the production um, uh, process, uh, sometimes the customers, the consumers, set the rules. If they don't want to consume your product, there's nothing you can do. And it's all about a mindset. I'm not an, uh, an expert in, in drugs, but I was told, you know, they are generic drugs, they are this, they are this, but all of them can cure. So if Africa start producing its own medicine, then we also have to shift our mindset to know which medicine can we consume. So I believe that um, our attitudes, our mindset will also contribute to uh, the success of this uh, initiative if we start thinking Africa first. There is also need for mobilizing financial resources uh, from the, the banks. I, I, I understand now uh, we are in good hands uh, with Philip. Uh, SG requests me to urge Philip to further support the development of pharmaceutical industry in the country. So I hope you are doing and uh, he will be happy to come and, and meet. So um, the development of the industry in Ghana and in Africa at large will result in the transfer of technology with international pharmaceutical companies, setting up plants and factories in the countries and creating employment opportunities for the teeming youthful population. The COVID-19 pandemic is a powerful reminder of how critical health issues are and the need for investment, decent job, and the most up-to-date technology, information, and the competencies to keep our communities and cities health and safe. With the right support and collaboration, we'll be able to scale up and diversify our production capabilities in pharmaceuticals. We have the capabilities, the expertise, the experience in pharmaceutical manufacturing to succeed. I think this is true when you listen carefully to what uh, my predecessors have said. So thank you very much for your kind attention. I will leave it here. Over back to you, moderator. Thank you, Prudence. Thank you so much. Right, so Prudence tells us that business people don't like speeches and all, so we want to just bring, take our last speech and then, and then we'll end it. And I was thinking that since uh, uh, Prudence from the AFCFT has spoken, it would be great that we also have the national coordinator for the AFCFTA to also give brief remarks 
and then we will take a short break and then we'll come back to our panel discussion where all of us have the opportunity to engage some of the speakers uh, and then chart a, a way forward. So I would like at this point to invite Dr. Farid Arthur, uh, who is the, the, the coordinator of the AFCFTA at the national level. Dr. Arthur, please. Allow me to trouble you a little bit. Good morning, good afternoon. I presume I've been offered as the dessert. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've been offered as the dessert for the very good uh, presentations we've had. Uh, like uh, Prudence, uh, or would you prefer Philip? <laughs> like Prudence had said, um, we don't want to repeat what has been so ably articulated by all the prior speakers. So I'll just, uh, first and foremost, I want to thank all of you for this very, very good initiative. And uh, I just to also say that I hope it's not just about the pharmaceuticals, it's about uh, our industry focus, because uh, there are some other areas too in which Ghana has proven comparative advantage in addition to the pharmaceuticals. And so I'm sure the banks will also uh, look at it. In specifics, uh, I mean specifically, I'd want to congratulate the Cal Bank. Somewhere in December last year, we, uh, from the national office, held a stakeholder meeting with financial institutions. And some of the suggestions that came out was the recommendation that the stakeholder institutions, particularly the financial institutions, uh, should set up desks for the AFCFTA. And uh, I'm glad to report that one of the first banks, indeed the first bank that wrote to us a couple of days afterwards that they had already set up their desk and everything, was the Cal Bank. So, so the Cal Bank uh, has indicated, has proven right from the beginning that they have bought into the AFCFTA, uh, you know, with all the commitment that it deserves. Uh, today when I was getting in, the flyer that I was given also has something like, uh, you can register for AFCFTA through our, through our bank, which is a, a very innovative, uh, you know, approach to the AFCFTA. So I want you to continue with that. I, I think uh, I'm indirectly also uh, congratulating our head of corporate services, is it? Who, who probably must have been part of the engineers for this uh, thing that we, we are seeing. Briefly speaking, I represent the National Coordination Office for AFCFT, and sometimes I get a lot of questions, what do you do? So I'll just give you a little bit of a heads up. Um, the National Coordination Office was set up in March 2020, in the middle of the COVID, or when, at the beginning of the COVID. And our first task was to ensure that Ghana had just then been awarded the right to host the Secretariat. And we were set up to ensure, first and foremost, that Ghana was ready for the Secretariat to start. And so uh, in the midst of COVID, we had to struggle to put together the what now hosts or houses the AFCFTA Secretariat. And then beyond that, we now had to also uh, undertake the assignment of preparing Ghana to be able to harness the benefits of the AFCFTA. In doing this, we've had several stakeholder meetings, one of which I just referred to, uh, recognizing the financial sector as key players. Our main focus is in seven areas. These seven areas is what we call the seven clusters for boosting in traffic and trade. And we have, what we have tried to do, this was a cluster that was discussed 10 years ago when the whole concept of AFCFTA was building up and uh, it was, uh, our task then was to try and domesticate the, these clusters so that they made sense to Ghana. And these clusters are in the area of trade policy, trade facilitation, trade infrastructure, 
enhancing productive capacity, trade information, finance, and then market integration. Obviously, trade policy, because uh, uh, our policies existed long before AFCFTA came into being, and one of our tasks here is to try and ensure that we adopt and adapt the policies on the ground, and also where necessary to encourage the uh, promotion of new policies that will en enhance our, our ability to uh, benefit from the AFCFTA. On trade facilitation, our task here is to try as much as possible to reduce all the non-tariff and technical barriers, basically to facilitate free movement of goods across our borders and internally between Ghana and the landlocked countries. On trade infrastructure, we are looking at uh, issues of enhancing the capacity of the country to uh, manage the uh, expected increase in volume of trade that will be, will be taking place. And this has been reflected by some of the projects that we have already seen ongoing, including the ports, the expansion ports, the port expansions, the uh, airports, and other things that are going on. What AFCFTA does, if nothing at all, is to force Africa to industrialize. About 90% of Africa is very similar. We have very few industrial countries, but most of us are agrarian countries. You take Ivory Coast, you take Ghana, our, and our economy is basically agrarian. And if we are going to be trading amongst ourselves, we cannot exchange cocoa beans for cocoa beans. We'll have to add value, you know. And so basically in the uh, productive uh, capacity area, that's what we are looking at. How can Ghana add value? And this is where uh, working closely with GEPA, uh, there were, there's 17 products have been identified in which Ghana has a comparative advantage. And one of them is also the pharmaceutical sector. On trade information, I think uh, uh, Dr. Doctor and uh, both Dr. and Simon also said something about the need for information. And uh, basically, if you're going to trade, you must know what is happening uh, in other places. And so we are trying to work closely with all the stakeholders, including the financial institutions, to develop what we call the Ghana Trade Information Repository, which we hope will link up with the African Trade Observatory, which will provide online access to information to stakeholders both those who want to access Ghana, but also Ghanaians who want to access other markets. Now the market integration element of what we do is that if we are going to be able to open up these markets, then we must be able to move freely across those markets to be able to set, uh, you know, camp in other places. We want, we, the, the ideal is that uh, moving from one market to the other across Africa, should just be like moving from Accra to Kumasi. You don't need to have to go for a visa or anything. If you wanted to invest, if today I decided that I'm going to open up a kiosk in Kumasi, so be it, nobody's going to ask me any uh, questions, so long as I follow the rules that Ghana has set up for setting up kiosks everywhere else in the country. And uh, I th that's one of the things we, we, we are looking at under market integration. The last focus is, of course, finance, which is the blood stream of every enterprise. Without finance, nothing happens. And in terms of Ghana, that is very important because uh, we will be competing with other countries. And some of the countries that we have have far better conditions in terms of even their interest rates. You know, it ranges from, yeah, across Africa, it ranges from about 7% to 20-something percent. And Ghana is in the 20-something percent area. So we're working with financial institutions with one of, one of our objectives for engaging financial institutions is to try and encourage the creation of innovative financial products uh, and also the creation of special purpose vehicles for supporting intra-African trade. Uh, this is something that we've been discussing and we hope to continue the discussion. And I'm glad to say that uh, so far, uh, you know, Carl Bank, uh, we've been, we've, I've met with them about three times, and there's been always the idea that we can work together. So these are some of the things that we are focused on. In terms of 
what specifically we've been doing, over the last years, we started what we call the market expansion uh, program for Ghanaian enterprises. The idea is, even though we are still preparing to really start trading, we wanted to get the Ghanaian enterprises ready. It's like uh, you don't wait until the World Cup before you start forming your football team, uh, which is typically what we do in Ghana here. <laughs> you know, so, so we want to put the team together before the, the, the match time gets closer. And in that program, what we did was is to try and target companies that we could identify that have potential to be able to access the African market. And uh, uh, the logic behind it was that even before AFTA came, there are Ghanaian companies that have been trading on the African market. And so they were our first uh, category of companies. Our job here is to try and work with them and prepare them to migrate onto the aftermarket once the market is open and the, and the and trading starts. The second group of companies we've been dealing with are the companies that export to other parts of the world but not to Africa. And they have a huge global marketing experience and we believe that working with them we could reorient this marketing experience onto the African market. The third group is, of course, the group that I also spoke about. That is the group that produces typically for the Ghanaian market. Most of them are under the 1D, 1F groups, and, uh, and, and, but there are others too. And uh, our job here is to make sure to, to see if they have products that with a little bit of improvement uh, will be able to access the African market. I'm glad to say that in the, in the, so far we are dealing with about 200, we've identified 200 companies We've audited about 100. Uh, last week, the report was about 100. We have profiled about 180. Uh, I don't want to go into the details, but that's work in progress. Out of this, we have a significant portion of them that are in the pharmaceutical industry. And most of the pharmaceutical industry, about 60% of them that we are dealing with, are in the category one group, which means they already export to Africa. Even before AFCFTA came, and so it will make our job a little bit easier. So as the icing on the cake, I don't want to turn myself into the meal. So I think at this point, I want to thank you once again, and uh, I hope that we'll continue this engagement. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Farid. And um, so now we take, uh, a break for three minutes, and then when we come back, we'll go to the second session of the program where we'll have our panel discussion. But it has been an interesting morning with all the information shared. So thank you all the, all the speakers for, for the information you've shared so far. So let's take a, a three minute break, and then we'll be back. And I would like to also acknowledge uh, our colleagues online. Uh, thank you for staying with us. We'll be back in three minutes. And please, if you have questions, Please put them in the chat on Zoom, or you can put it on Facebook where we are also live, and then we'll get it, and then we'll ask our panelists on your behalf. Thank you all so much, and we'll be back. Dear Board of Directors, CEOs, and industry, yes, all of industry should get this. In today's ever-growing marketplace, expansion and progress must certainly be on your mind. It is on ours too, because we look forward to grow with you. We are able to get as much financing as your corporate projects need and to see to their successful completion in the best possible timing. How? It's a new day. Well, we are responsible. We do business the right way with regard for sound financial, social and ethical practices. We are effective, knowledgeable and even more so with each new experience wielding expertise built from decades of facilitating the financing of the grandest of projects with exceptional dedication. We are decisive, not just because we take good decisions, but because we make sound decisions based on risk, local market knowledge, opportunity, and timing. In fact, there are several projects we have facilitated in the energy, real estate, education, power, and manufacturing sectors to be modest. Surely your project is next. Contact us today so that we can move forward together. It is possible. Best regards, Carl Bank.
Don't forget the balloons, Check. the DJ, Check. and the drinks. Listen, honey, I've got this party under control, okay? Daddy, <laughs> don't forget our birthday cake with the sparkly candles. Daddy, are you there? The parties are 4 p.m., honey. Don't be late. With the all new CowPay on the CowBank app and website, you don't have to worry about carrying cash. Just place your order with your favorite merchant and pay with a Visa or MasterCard, mobile money or CowBank account, or scan and pay. Visit the Play Store or App Store and download the CowBank app today. CowBank app. Forget to cash. CowBank. Forward to get. They call me Kwame Short. I don't like long things at all. That's why I signed up for the Cowbank Snap account as a Cowbank agent. It's easy to open and perform transactions just like this. Jack, let's say. Mm. <laughs> Cowbank Agents Banking is a new biometric banking channel that allows any customer of Cowbank to make transactions at their convenience. You can open a Cowbank Snap account, make cash deposits and withdrawals, transfer funds, pay your bills, and also buy airtime in three easy steps. First, select your transaction, then provide your details, and finally, confirm your transaction with your fingerprint. It's that convenient and secure. Always remember to take your receipt and look out for an SMS after your transaction before walking away. You can find Cowbank agents everywhere. Shops, general merchants, pharmacies, mobile money agents, and supermarkets. Cowbank Agents Banking, your neighborhood bank. Forward together. Sometimes you need it early. Sometimes you need it late. Sometimes you need it fast. Sometimes you need it closer. But with CarBank, accessing your funds is always easy. With CarBank Agent Banking, you can easily open your CarBank Snap account, make cash deposits and withdrawals, transfer funds, pay bills, etc. right in your neighborhood at pharmacy, shop, filling station and supermarkets. So, visit your nearest CarBank agent today. Open your CarBank Snap account and enjoy banking on your terms using our CarBank Agent Banking. Cow Bank Agent Banking, your neighborhood bank. Forward together. Thank you so much, uh, and welcome back from, from the sh our short break. So we'll go straight into our next session, which will be the panel discussion. And this will be the opportunity for us to interrogate some of the issues a little bit more. And we'll also give an opportunity to our online uh, audience to also uh, send their questions in that we can also answer in-house. And we'll invite some of the, of the speakers, not all, to take, to, to take a seat here. But then every, every question that you ask, you have for any of the speakers, the other speakers will also be available. And then you can bring them in and then we can address them. Specifically, if you have any questions for the presentation by Bright Simmons, please bring it as early as possible so that we can deal with it. Uh, so I'd like to invite uh, here Kwesi Enchi from the Ministry of Trade and Industry. And then also invite Justina, Justina to take a seat. Prudence, please take a seat. No, no, any party. You can sit anywhere you, you like. Okay. Um, Mr. Charles Fodjo, please take a seat. Is Ravi still online? Ravi is still online. Okay, great. Charles, uh, Mr. Bright Simmons, please. Yeah, please, please join there. have Ravi yet. Is 
Ravi on? One minute. Okay. So we'll try and then get Ravi back online. Uh, but, but as we wait for him, we'll, take, we'll, we'll, we'll start the conversation. So I'll start with you, Charles. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, welcome to, to the second session. I'll start with you, Charles. I had started a conversation with you about, you see, we want to develop our industry in Ghana here. But in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, sub, in the value chain, there's also a strong role that is played globally by the biopharmaceutical, the Roches, the, the Pfizer's, and all that. And they came to the fore significantly during this COVID with their research-based uh, industry. We have the presence of these companies in Ghana as well, and other parts of Africa. With this vision of developing our pharmaceutical industry, are there any lessons that we can learn from them, on the one hand? And then secondly, from somebody like you who has been on the inside, is there any way or other areas where we can partner with them to also help us in the vision that we are trying to chart uh, at the moment? Okay. So if, um, uh, maybe just for the purposes of those who don't understand the biopharmaceutical, yes, uh, right. so we have um, the industry, the big Pfizer and those ones have now moved beyond the capsules and the syrups and those ones, and they are now doing what we call biologics, biopharmaceutical medicines, which are more precise when you take it. It's not like the tablet that you take it and it was, you swallow it before it goes into your bloodstream and that. But some 50, 70 years ago, that is where they were. They said they were doing the syrups, the capsules, and the tablets. So that is where they built their competence by discovering their own medicines. They were not doing generics. They are scientists who produce something that is new and then it becomes their own. Then for 20 years, they have intellectual protection that they alone can sell that molecule for 20 years, which helps them to recoup the investment and then they, that's how they build their industry. Then their government will buy that medicine from them for, to treat medicines in that country for free so that by the time they are producing they are assured of um, of uh, the market already that policy support and that does support is what made all those companies become so big so today they have left that capsules and those creams there that are there for us to to do because we are now competing with the indians and then the pakistanis to be doing the syrups and those ones if you don't do it then we continue to import it into the country so I would say that is a good starting point for us in Sub-Sahara. The ones that the Rush and the Pfizer have left, we should leave it. But the good thing in terms of where can we collaborate from them, they are ready to share learning. I don't think that we should be in a hurry to say we are doing biopharmaceuticals. So I agree we should be thinking about the vaccines. The vaccines are biopharmaceuticals anyway. They are for preventive medicines. But the number of diseases that we use to treat are very few. So they are ready to collaborate with us to sh give a technical know-how because as a give back. So they will do that. But where we need to really start from will be the syrups and the capsules and the creams and those ones where when the young one, if we take the, if we take the India model, where the government has that support. If a young person comes from pharmacy, they are giving that support to start doing creams and doing the OTC medicines. Then they'll build the capability and then the money to move into a precision medicines. And then when they build their own industry, they will become exporting to develop markets like America and those ones. And that is where India got those. So we should just learn that transformative me method. I honestly heard what our colleague is saying from trade. I think that one will let us crawl. That policy support will let us crawl. Let us think the in Indian way. Today we have sitting right in, in cabinet the Ghana uh, pharmaceutical strategy, which is a document that will open up pharmaceutical uh, manufacturing like the way that India is doing. Right from setting up a secretariat, funding, incubation support, everything like the way the India did. That is what the, the industry needs. That policy support together with the financing partners and therefore they become attractive as a, the true hub. If we do what we are doing, we will crawl. I wish um, I'll give you an opportunity to respond immediately, but just think about the, the, the answer and then I'll come back to you. Mr. Note, I've noticed you, give me a minute. 
Um, EF, AFCFT, I just want to ask this question. You know, across Africa, and, and here I'm focusing on the farmer industry, in Ghana, in Nigeria, and other parts of uh, sub Saharan Africa, one of the policies that have been put in place to help develop the local industry are some sort of restrictions, prohibitions, you know, in, uh, yeah, import prohibition policies or restrictions. In Ghana, for example, it's open. We have a certain number of about 40 products that are reserved for local production only. I think, and I'm no, I'm no expert, that these are important to get the industry to grow. But I also know that the people in trade and other things do not like those kind of policies. Where does the AFCFTA stand with that? And what policies do you have as an alternative in case you don't encourage this to ensure that our industries are not, though young, obviously young, are not consumed by other bigger companies if they are not protected? Put it on. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I think, uh, first of all, uh, the question that we have to ask ourselves is whether um, do we really have those industries in place? Because before you protect, um, you have to protect what you have. And some of the countries that we have seen that have been protective are countries that do not even produce. You protect an industry. We have seen this um, um, in many parts of the world, uh, especially in Africa, where you protect an industry that cannot even produce 10% of what you need at national level. Um, th there is a time, I come from Rwanda, there is a time uh, when I was in the Ministry of Trade uh, we were discussing with the uh, sugar producers and they were seeking protection from government. Then when we went to the statistics, they were only producing 10% of the sugar that is produced in Rwanda. I mean that is consumed in Rwanda. So then we tell them, how can you assure us that if we protect you, you are going to supply the market? I think that's the starting point. If you go to the pharmaceutical industry, we have seen the figures that we are still importing up to $16 billion. Are we able to produce those $16 billion worth pharmaceutical products? Then we protect our market. So if each and every country is relying on imports, then there's no point of protecting that country itself. What we need to do is to come up with a strategy as Africa. A strategy that will allow us to invest in our productive capacities we produce as a continent. Because a country alone cannot be competitive with the rest of the big companies for a number of reasons. The market is small, the market we are protecting is small, but also the capabilities of those national industries are not to the level of those big companies. So if we pull resources as Africa, then companies can work together to make sure that they can produce a product that will be competitive in the global market. The second aspect that FCFT is bringing on table is how can we better then protect the market of Africa against those uh, big companies. Using the FCFT rules of origin, you're already protecting the Africa's market. Mm -hmm. Anything that we qualify as originating from Africa, anything that will meet the requirements of the local content as originating from Africa, we qualify for the FCFTA market. And then this will give a favorable environment for all investors in the pharmaceutical industry on the continent, whether they are coming from outside the, co the continent or whether they are coming from within the continent. So are you saying we should throw away our protectionist po uh, policies? Of course. <laughs> they are baseless. That's what I said. If you can't produce what you need, then for 100 years, what are you protecting? Well, let me challenge you a little bit on that, and, and then we go on. So today, the industry, for example, maybe Ghana needs, I don't know, maybe, let's assume, $10 million worth of paracetamol. And the industry in Ghana produces... Um, 
let me use your example, maybe, maybe $500,000 worth. So there's a huge gap. But the huge gap exists also because in the space, I mean, the space is not there. The space is made up of other paracetamols in the market. And the thinking is that if you stopped these products from coming in, I will be able to have the capacity. I mean, I have the capacity, but I can't use it. But then I'll be able to use it to fill the gap. But if you don't protect it, then it is difficult for me to penetrate. I think that is the thinking of the local industry. Um, is, that, is that a problem? Um, I, I said that uh, Ghana is only producing 30%. So you're producing, we are thinking about... If you are producing 30% now, mm -hmm. you need 70% from outside. Yeah. Do you choose from out, outside Africa or from within Africa? So the FCFT is encouraging you to look inward. Okay. So what you need, instead of looking from India, from Europe, from US, can't we produce it within Africa? Right. And then can your companies expand across Africa? not only operate in Ghana, but expand. Can you integrate in the value chain of the sector within the continent? Because that will give you more leverage, okay. even to grow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Justina, um, my question is still on the finance, but then also I'd like your input from, from the Ministry of Trade and Industry. If you understand that we are thinking about manufacturing, right, and then Pharmaceutical manufacturing, unlike other manufacturing facilities, they have certain requirements that they have to go through. So if the plant, even the air that is used in the facility has to be of a certain standard, right? So the initial investment required to put up a plant that, that fits the requirements that can go international is quite high. And I don't think that most investors in-house on their own can have the capital to be able to do that. So they need support from. But they also cannot do that profitably if they are getting the, the, the financing support at the commercial level like, like you have. And I know that you also have a business to, to do. What policy do you think beyond what exists or even with what exists, how do we modify it in a way from your understanding of the market to ensure that financial industries that are going to take up this and establish facilities that can even go beyond Africa, are able to get the financing needed that is comfortable enough to be able to use it and pay it over a long period of time at an affordable rate. I know you can't do it alone. You may need government support. What should that be? What would you look out for? So um, from where we sit, yeah. the big thing is that long-term type funding right. okay and i hear you on commercial rates it's not necessarily the case that if it's commercial rates you can you can do it but i think that in conjunction with um, the policy makers looking at maybe some funding support that goes in as equity um, that can be taken out later on so not just a 1d1f that reduces um, the interest bearing on the project. But maybe something like government opting to have some preferences in these um, industries. So from the beginning, at least what the, the amount of debt that they have to take from the market is not too significant. Then of course, in the long run, they know that their cash flow can pay for it. And then government decides that, look, after year five, if you are profitable, we'll start taking our equity back, and then we can plow it back into other businesses. And so you can look at um, things like that. But the policies that we have currently, like I mentioned, are such that government takes some of the burden, especially when it comes to interest, um, like Ghana Cares, you get some tax reliefs, you get um, uh, subsidizing of your or subsidies on your um, your interest rates. I think that we're too quick um, to focus on cost. Okay. There are other ways of doing this. Sometimes it's putting the right paperwork together. Sometimes there are lots of grants um, out there, people willing to help you with the research and say, look, I'll make funds available to you for a year or two. 
to make sure that um, your business is viable? Are we investing in the right amount of research from day one? Um, so once you have that done properly, and once you do the research, we, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. There are other systems that are being run that are extremely efficient. What I find um, from where I sit when we do some of these manufacturing facilities is a lot of people go for um, equipment that are obstinate, equipment that are not efficient. Um, and so before you know, their costs are so high. Mm. But it's not because you can't do the same thing for cheaper. So I think that it's, yes, it's, it's a give and take. We can put policy in place. But are we willing to look beyond the face value of most of the things that we do and see how, I mean, there are roads that we're building 10 million per kilometer and there are roads that we're building a million per kilometer. And I find that usually the ones that are built a million per kilometer last longer. So um, I think it's our willingness, like I mentioned in my presentation, to do a little more homework um, and come up with things that work. But look, like I mentioned, you can, government can decide. I think that it's usually the easiest in, um, in other jurisdictions. Um, I know that for Minerals Commission, they are looking at the Minerals Investment Fund um, to be able to do that, where they subsidize equity, and then along the line, government works out gradually, you know, and then it makes it easier. But the system doesn't do long-term funding. Right. Our markets usually would place you between three years, five years. And that is quite difficult for any manufacturing plant. Um, but Calbank is different. We, we've gone as far as 10 years. We raised 12-year money two years ago to be able to support businesses like that, manufacturing facilities, so that the free cash flow you have is not pressured too much. And then you can plow back into your business. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. My, I just need one like my follow-up question. No, follow-up, another question. In dealing with the pharma the, or the companies that you've dealt with, what has been maybe for the time for time's sake one challenge that you think if we could and you, I think you attempted to bring some of them out, but just highlight one challenge that you think that if we're able to deal with or focus on dealing with, it will make our access to financing a little bit easier for you. Governance. Okay. Corporate governance, I, I think that that is extremely significant. We have one-man businesses. We don't want to do the right paperwork. Because I'm from Calbank, you are, I'm a local bank, and therefore I shouldn't ask for papers. Mm. Um, and it, it all goes to the heart of who's running the business. What are the person's objectives? Is he looking for a company or an institution that can go... Um, con continental and can play worldwide. Um, what kind of systems is he willing to put in place? If somebody comes in and wants an equity stake, do you have the right valuations done? Or are you even willing to split so that you can get, um, I always say 100% of even 50 is 50. But if you have 100% of zero, you know, so why don't you split shareholding come partner together, um, I have a bit, you have a bit, you know. And then we put the right structures, right paperwork. Um, I find that the people who are setting up businesses, they're using funds provided them by friends. They don't have any paperwork to govern it. So just when the business is taking off, this one comes and says, it's my money you used, I'm pulling it out. And because of these governance issues, the businesses just crumble. And then our huge businesses are owned by one big man who wants to remain the big man, is not willing to share responsibility, hire the right people to support him or, or her, and once they are ill, the business comes crumbling down. Uh, once somebody, you owe somebody, the person goes into court, um, you put all these measures in place, suddenly there's no business. So for me, I think one of the biggest things is governance. When you open it up to more people and different ideas, um, they'll walk you to that institution or that individual who can play a certain role in your governance structure that will help you raise the right funds, um, put the right structures, um, get the right um, approvals 
regulatory approvals and go in place. So I think the big thing is governance. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, the chairman of the chamber and then the chief are here, so they could. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you want to say something? Okay. Just a minute. Let me just finish with um, with with. Um, right. Right. I have two questions for you. One is not necessarily business promotion, but you know, with the way we are trying to go, counterfeiting will be a likely a, a huge issue. I mean, people are going to take advantage of rules of origin and all that, and just put anything in the market. And I know you've done a lot of work in the area of counterfeiting and all that. Um, how do you suggest that we can think about preventing counterfeiting as we build the industry? On the, on the one hand, at the internal level, the private sector level, and then on the policy side, do we think we have adequate policies in place to be able to deal effectively and decisively with the issues of counterfeiting? That's on the fair. You finish that, and I'll come to harmonization afterwards. Thanks, Kobina. I think one of the um, um, blind spots that I've perceived as we've had this discussion throughout the day is we've really concentrated on manufacturing, but we have to look at the entire value system, okay. uh, value uh, uh, chain, and the entire ecosystem. Okay. Um, retail is important, distribution is important, wholesaling, logistics, cold chain, for those that are trying to do biologics or to sell biologics and the rest, they are all important. My sense is that that is where counterfeiting then becomes an issue. Because if you're not thinking of the entire value chain and how the products move and how they come in, you know, smuggling becomes an issue, revenue, then government um, sometimes reimposes technical barriers, as we saw on the border between Nigeria and Benin. I assure you, we can talk about all the benefits of AFTA, you know, that we want. If governments felt that they were under threat, they would shut the borders. And we saw that in Nigeria, in Benin. I mean, notwithstanding ECOWAS, they shut the borders. So my sense of it is we have to take a very value chain, ecosystemic perspective. And that is where the counterfeiting issues then arise, where technology can play a great role with traceability and all of the other things that we have been preaching for a decade and a half, with very little progress being made in countries like Ghana. The other quick point I wanted to make in the same um, context is when you take profit margins, for instance, it's amazing to observe that in Europe and America, profit margins of pharmaceuticals is nearly 80%. The gross profit margins, I mean. The highest in any industrial sector. The closest is in technology, which is around 60%. If you go into distribution and the rest of it, you find out that it declines significantly to around 30%. And it's not surprising, therefore, that we have a huge and booming pharmaceutical trade environment and the rest of it, but it's not as wealthy. Because a lot of the money is in uh, uh, the higher value, uh, uh, sorry, the high end of the value chain. Mm. But here's what's interesting. When you take generics, and you take generics as an, uh, an abstract category, so mm. basically people that don't have their own patents and trademarks and likes of it, you find out that their value, their profit margin declines to as low as 25%. Even more interesting, when you take branded generics, there's a study in India now, that shows up to a thousand percent in profit margin on branded generics. Why? Here, here is the, here's the trick. By foregoing the patent dynamic, mm -hmm. they can make it for very cheap. Mm -hmm. So to give you an example, prophylactic for HIV infections, mm -hmm. and the manufacturing cost is in the range of about $10. Mm -hmm. You can sell it for $80 without any problem whatsoever. Mm -hmm. When you have a patent for it and you are protected, mm -hmm. It goes as high as $30,000 a year mm -hmm. for something that costs maybe $20 to make, $30,000 a year. The difference, though, is if I'm making it as a generic producer mm -hmm. and I'm spending just $20 to do so, mm -hmm. and I did not account for the cost of development, because the reason why mm -hmm. the big pharmaceutical companies want to charge so much is that they have 10 years research, right? Mm -hmm. But I am foregoing that bit. And yet still, I'm able to build brand equity and therefore sell the generic as branded. Mm -hmm. Then I can sell the generator for $5,000 and make a huge amount of money without any of the in, uh, risk bond. Okay. And we've seen it in India where we've done deep uh, research and discovered that there are branded generic companies now making 1,000%, whereas in Europe and America, they're making 80% and they're on top of the world. That's credible. That means that we have to be extremely smart in the way that we design the ecosystem mm -hmm. and how we understand the way the ecosystem works. Mm -hmm. Brand equity development is something that has to be conscious. I'll give you a very last example in this area. If you take Ghana, the nutraceutical sector, mm -hmm. they don't do any serious R&D. 
But the nutraceuticals, I'm not going to mention a, a, a name, but there's a, a company that got into trouble during COVID. People were marketing the product as, you know, for COVID. And they were making so much money in terms of gross profit margin, and people were spending hundreds of Ghana cities on the product. But the interesting thing about that dynamic was the brand equity they had built. You may not be happy with the ethics that went into it, overselling and all of that. But all of that overselling and people, you know, over advertising, you know, the, the, the drug that uh, can cure 100 uh, ailments, all of that is an attempt to build brand equity. So now understanding the brand equity dynamic, what do we do within ethics to improve brand equity of Ghanaian products? And that's where Brand Ghana was a big shambles because the thinking around national branding was not simply that you brand Ghana as an abstract entity. Is that when we say Swiss chocolate, it immediately has a 50% extra margin because of the way Switzerland has gone about with natural branding. Not because Switzerland itself brands itself, but the way that the Swiss brand confers advantage on the local brand. So the Ghana Pharma brand, I know because I was running around the continent trying to push my technology systems for, um, uh, what do we call it, for anti cancer yeah. And Ghana had an interesting brand in pharma as having more quality products. Mm -hmm. We didn't build on it systematically. We should have built on that systematically to the point where if I put made in Ghana on my drug, immediately I have a 5% appreciation or 15% appreciation on price in the region. Mm. So brand equity is going to be so critical, the Ghana brand mm -hmm. on the product. And we have to rethink brand Ghana, but not in the way that we did it in the past, where we're thinking branding Ghana for investment, but fundamentally about what does the brand Ghana mean when I put on the product. Mm. So do you want me to go straight to the harmonization? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that I... I, I will vary a little bit what Charles said about personalized medicine. Okay. I agree with Charles that, yes, it's a bit far ahead for us. You know, we have got basic things to solve. But it's an interesting dynamic that people are not looking at when they think about personalized medicine. Uh, I sit on the sustainability board, the advisory board, of uh, uh, a Belgian biopharmaceutical company okay. called UCB. So we are like, we are a small player. We are like $5 billion uh, globally. But $5 billion is also the amount for the whole of West Africa. So a small Beijing company is actually a very significant company in that regard. And we, we are thinking a lot about genomics, but the way that we are thinking of genomics as a European company mm -hmm. should be very different from the way a Ghana entity thinks of genomics. And I'll explain in a minute. Genomics simply means looking at the uh, genetic makeup of the patient and using that to influence the way you make the medicine. Mm -hmm. So that what works for you may not work for me because of our genetic differences. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing, if we think hard about it, it means, therefore, that some of the medicines that are going to work for Africans mm -hmm. will not be the same medicine that work for Europeans and Americans. Right. But that introduced a natural protection barrier. Mm. Because what that means, therefore, is that if I know my Ghana very well, and I collect a lot of genomic data on Ghanaians, and the law protects the collection of that genomic data, then I'm able to make medicines for Africans, like cancer medicine, oncology, for example, which is highly personalized, that performs way better than any American competitor. Okay. Why? Because my government prevents the American companies like Pfizer from collecting the same data in Ghana. So how do we think about genomics, biopharma, brand equity? These are things that I think we don't pay enough attention to. And it's going to involve the multi-stakeholder innovation, thought leadership platforms, where we are really outthinking the rest of the world. And I think that's where the opportunity will lie. And harmonization should be thought of in that same context. Yeah, I think you've introduced a, a quite an interesting... So we can still be innovative, you know, in, in our own way. Yeah. Thank you. That's interesting. So that was my first round. Um, do you want? Are you ready with your reactions now, or oh, I should go around and come back? Mr. Norte, your hand was up first. Um, I'm really keen to. Can we give the microphone to Mr. Norte? Are you reacting? Let's go. Okay. Bright will have to leave us. Bright, thank you so much. Um, no, I, I, I'm, I'm not reacting. I'm just uh, sharing. Making an uh, input. Yes, okay. making an input. Um, from the speakers who have made their submissions this morning, it looks like uh, there are very uh, interesting pillars within the pharmaceutical sector, which the sector is not taking uh, uh, advantage of. Okay. But uh, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to announce that the, the, the government has put in place the Ghana, pharmaceutical, uh, the Ghana, uh, the Ghana Jet Project. The Ghana Jet Project is a FCDO sponsored uh, program supporting Ghana's industrialization in the three anchor industries of uh, automobile, textiles and garments, and pharmaceuticals. And I'm here because I'm the pharmaceutical 
sector lead. What this uh, project is doing is basically to help uh, create jobs. That is the main objective of this project. And the project is around to support any industry which, is, which, is, which needs help to cross the line to create jobs. So the, the, the project is available. It is a, 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 a partnership between Palladium, uh, Ministry of uh, Trade and Industry, and other partners. And if you need information about the project, you go to the Ministry of uh, Trade and Industry. You can get, you, you talk to me too. We, can, uh, we have our offices at Jowu. And we are supposed, we are prepared to support any industry in the automobile, in Texas, and, and pharmaceutical to cross the line with various instruments. So I just want to give you this, this information. Including and I financing. Think, sorry? Including financing. Any instrument. OK. I don't want to take the wheel out of a car bank. That's <laughs> why I didn't mention sure. this. But we're prepared to support with any instrument okay. to cross the line and create jobs. OK. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for that information. Ireland. Ah, yeah, OK. After Ireland. Or your hand was after Ireland. Right. Thank you very much, Kwabna, for the opportunity. My question goes to uh, Justina. Good afternoon. Um, my question follows that of the moderator. Uh, you mentioned that you are positioned to support pharma companies willing to set up at the pharma pack. That is very key. Now, from what Kwabna asked, you can see that there are a lot of you know, components within the establishment. Looking at it, if you understand the establishment at the park as it is, what component do you think that CalBank is positioned to finance? For example, it comes with you know, land acquisition that an acre is going for about initially $60,000 and now it's around 50,000. So if a company is going there, acquiring about 10 to 15 acres before coming to equipment planted and all that, which one do you think that, frankly, CalBank is positioned? So that if one is going there, you don't bank all your hopes on CalBank only to be disappointed. My second question also still comes to you, Justina. You also mentioned that you are positioned to raise LCs for companies who are into imports. Okay. The problem here is that banks will tell you all the nice things, present to you all the documentation, just as you said, that documentation is key. I, I alongside aside that, you just mentioned, you know, uh, governance. Okay. You find yourself presenting to the bank all the necessary documentations that are needed only to be tossed here and there. They tell you, oh, you have everything that we need, you know, but then nothing comes out of it. You are tossed here and there forever. The next one is that would financing that be businesses, question. okay. Would your financing of the business be based on the viability of the business or the company's ability to pay back. Kwabna, I'm the chairman for Community Practice Pharmacists Association. Mm -hmm. And permit me to do this. We are talking about the pharmaceutical industry, mm -hmm. industry. And down the value chain, you see retailers at the end. Yeah. You know, marketing and dispensing what the manufacturer has produced and what the distributor has brought in and distributing. Yeah. How is CalBank positioned to help these pharmaceutical companies, I mean community pharmacies, or if you, if you like, retail pharmacies, to be able to you know, help with the health of the nation? Looking at it that during the pandemic, community pharmacies have been one of the people at the forefront. They face the challenge even before they get to the hospital. So it tells you how resilient that part of the industry is. How are you positioned to help community pharmacies? Thank you. 
Wow, that was uh, okay. all that to Justina. Okay, I think you can take the ones that. Okay, yeah. so I'll take the ones I remember, and then you can help me remember the rest if I don't remember. Okay, so the first one was the Dawa Industrial Park. And um, I mentioned that we had signed an MOU with um, the chamber. And you're asking what kind of support we're willing to provide. And I'll take, yes, which components? And I'll take that with your third question, which said, would we look at a project that is viable or we would you look at the institution's ability to repay? Okay. So um, we've been there. We've seen that one of the big things is making sure that the infrastructure is in place. Um, so that, yes, when you're buying that land, um, you know that some key services have been made available to you. And then it allows you to develop your project properly. With that, that is something that the bank can look to doing if the cash flows make sense. In my submission, if you remember, I said that this is not a social thing for the bank. We also have stakeholders that we make sure um, benefit from the process. So we would look at your projects, or we would look at, so let's say, what's the institution's name? So I can use that as an example. OK, so let's say community pharmacy practice decided that you're a team of um, institution pharmacists and you wanted to have a manufacturing facility at the Dawa Industrial Park. We could look at you and your cash flows, your free cash flow, and then see if you as an institution of um, pharmacists can, with your free cash flow, afford um, whichever project it is that you're doing. Or we can look at it project specific. Like I said, if you're doing it from a project finance perspective, then even though key project finance has no recourse to the owners of a business, this one would tie in a bit of your existing business to um, whatever project it is that you're putting up. Like I mentioned, we as a bank would be looking to do slightly longer term funding than the typical one year, two year, three year type funding that you find on the market. And with that, you'd be able to repay. But of course, all other systems must be um, working properly. And um, the pricing then will be a factor of all the required ones by the um, rules that govern banking, as well as a certain risk premium. Okay. And our partnerships also then determine what kind of pricing comes to you at the end of the day. Because if we used a 1D1F route, the pricing will be less, and the pressure on your business would be less. So we can do both your ability to pay and the viability of your project, depending on the assessment that is done and your provision of as much information as possible. Like I said, this is a, a, a knowledge fetching yeah. um, exercise for us. Okay. Then, um, yes. Then you spoke about, um, we say we, we will provide you with LCs and all of that. And you bring all your documentation, and we don't do it. Um, I was in Kumasi working with clients last week. And everywhere I went, they actually attested to the fact that CAL is different when it comes to global trade and international trade. We understand what your needs are, but you have to give us information. Um, we've had instances where people walk into the bank. By the 24-hour period, within a 24-hour period, they have their LCs established. That is if you're backing it with some kind of cash. If it means that we have to take on your risk, where we have to give you a facility to support your LC, then really the whole process is like a loan giving process. And then depending on your size, your risk profiling, it can take, um, we've done some in two, three days, we've done some in six weeks or more, depending on availability of information. Um, so, we're different when it comes to things like that. Global trade, we take very seriously. Then the last one is whether or not um, we really mean it when we say we're supporting the retail businesses to thrive. I mentioned that we actually have a product that we call the Cal Pharma Scheme. And it's for retail pharmacies. Um, we give you up to a certain amount unsecured. And we're mindful of how many people are walking into your shop, 
what you are doing with national health insurance and all of that. And then we provide you the support for you to be able to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Financing is really important. So I, I want to limit the questions that come to you for now. I want to take some questions from the uh, aud uh, audience online. Just a minute, please. Um, somebody, um, Ravi, are you, are you, Ravi, okay, I can see Ravi, I can see you. Somebody asked this question that how can Director General of Pharmaxil support the training, training of over 100 Ghana, Ghanaian pharmacists in Indian institutions like NIPA since Ghana, India has shared values? I think, is there a way that Ghana can partner with India to train some pharmacists, perhaps in manufacturing related? Uh, topics, I suppose. So, Ravi, is there? Do you have a response for us on that? Can we bring Ravi on? Sorry, he's on. Okay, yeah. Ravi, I suspect. So okay. On we can hear you now. Sorry. We can hear you now. Yeah. You want me to repeat? Yes, please. Okay. So the the NIPERS actually are more of an academic and research institutions uh, of government of India. So by the hundred training for over hundred pharmacists, what kind of training is needed for the pharmacists? Once uh, that, that should be clear. That is on the community pharmacy side or. Uh, manufacturing uh, pharmacy side or uh, research or uh, academics. So these, these are the things uh, one should be very specific. Okay. If they are very, very specific, then we can uh, work out uh, with our uh, Indian Embassy in uh, Accra and we'll coordinate with the Minister of uh, Chemicals and Fertilizers and we'll think about it if they have very specific uh, the, the, the plan. So I'll also share my uh, uh, email ID, so they can uh, they can uh, write to us uh, through Ghana National Chamber of Pharmacy. They are uh, in regular touch with us. Thank you, thank you, Ravi. There's also another question from Kofi Adwejekum. He says, um, "That's to AFCFTA, uh, but it's also finance related." He says that my difficulty is the cost of capital and market availability for the produce from the local pharmaceutical manufacturing fronts. How is AFCFTA leveraging their huge platform to afford pharma manufacturers access to low cost of capital and ready markets? Yes, um, I, I think this is going to be, of course, better addressed by the bank, but uh, let me share with you what we are doing. Right. Um, the AFCFTA Secretariat is partnering with uh, African financial institutions um, to see how we can put in place a risk um, mitigation fund. Because we know um, um, if you go to the bank as an individual country, uh, company, uh, the, the first thing that they will ask you is what is the collateral? And if you don't have it, uh, as a small and medium enterprise, then how can you get access to the funding? Um, so we thought if uh, we, we work together uh, with financial institutions uh, such as Development Bank, we are already working with the uh, uh, Africa Import and Export Bank, Afrixim Bank. We are working with the African Development Bank uh, to see how we can um, set up something that a uh, commercial bank will buy in and then use it as a guarantee uh, to provide small loans to those who cannot afford loans. So that's the only thing that we can do. Uh, we do not offer money, but we can create a facility that can be used by, uh, uh, by SMEs. Uh, we also have what we call a safety adjustment facility. The Air Safety Adjustment Facility uh, was meant uh, to address uh, some challenges that countries, fiscal challenges that countries will face when they start liberalizing the market. Uh, but when we start working on the facility with the, in partnership with our Frexim Bank, we realize that the facility has to go beyond um, assisting um, countries 
for fiscal um, uh, issues. We, we have created a fund uh, that will have three components, uh, which will have a general fund, a credit fund, and a base fund. And then we will invite all those investors that want to invest into that fund to put in money, and part of that money can be used uh, to assist uh, those who will be willing to um, invest in the FCFTA market. Okay. So those are the two products that we are looking forward to uh, for now, but I believe the conversation will still uh, go on. Okay, thank you. There's a question. Okay, so first of all, um, Charles said that the policies that you have in place, his view is that it will make us call. So I would like you to respond to that. That's first of all. Secondly, I mean, that is, is, is not, um, is a view on it. I mean, some other people also shared a similar view. Um, then the second question is online. It says that the acceptance of made in Africa pod, uh, pharmaceutical products within either the Africa, African or global markets is largely dependent on the cost of products, i.e. competitive pricing. A key element in the cost or price is the cost of key inputs such as active ingredients and reagents. Is there some consideration or strategy regarding the production of these key manufacturing inputs in Africa to help lower the cost of the final product to improve acceptance across markets? That's from Eugene Alponsa. You, you got the, 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 we got the question? Yeah. Okay. So can you kindly respond to Charles first, and then you can take this, and then we'll try and then round up and then bring the session to a close. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think that um, looking at the pharmaceutical industry, um, there are various challenges fa facing various um, tiers of the industry. So um, you can't use a one-size-fits-all approach to address the various challenges that the industry is facing. You may have startups, you may have those in between, you may have those who are at the end there who may need some support for um, market expansion. Um, market expansion. So um, for us, um, we are expected to devise these various um, approaches towards addressing the challenges facing the industry. And what we are currently embarking on, if maybe you may be a startup, you, ca you can apply um, through the 1D1F. The Exim um, facility is also available to help you start up your business. Um, if you want to expand your business, the 1D1F as well as the Exim facility is there for you. So um, there are various interventions that are supposed to address the various challenges that the industry is facing. So it depends on um, what you want to do and then um, the approach that, you, that is supposed to be devised to addressing the, the issue. So that would be my um, opinion on what um, he expressed. And then with the um, industry, I think that when we're talking about the industry, we're talking about the development of the value chain, as um, Bright initially said. And um, it's dependent on the industry to identify some of the most critical <coughs> ingredients that is needed for the development of the industry. If you look, for example, um, during the COVID period when um, ethanol became very critical to the um, production of ethanols, uh, most of the factories that were supported under the one district one factory were um, ethanol companies who helped in the production of ethanols to produce um, ethanol for the um, sanitizer production. So um, if you also look at the, um, the JET program that um, Mr. Norte made mention about, we are looking at the development of um, APIs under the JET program, even though we have uh, different opinions on that subject matter as well. So for government, we are not just looking at the end of the value chain, but we are looking at the, at the uh, we are taking a comprehensive look at the value chain from the development of um, APIs through the manufacturing and then to the retail as he made mention of. Thank you. All right. Um, do I have some time? Okay, so we'll take one last question, but just, just on your point on the first one. I think that there's been talk about focusing, or the government focusing on the pharmaceutical industry as a, as a hub, as a, you know. And so I think Charles's point is that we have to at some point, and not because I'm, I'm in the industry, but we have to at some point treat the industry with some difference from what we do generally for industry as a whole, you see. 
so that we can achieve the target that we are trying to we are trying to if we continue to make the policies available for the financial industry to also be part of it then you know we, we, are, we like he said I, I, mean, I don't agree with crawl but i don't i don't have a better word but then it takes us a longer time to achieve the purpose so can we decide that look we are focusing we are doing this specially for the pharma industry and we are doing it over a five seven year period and within by the end of that seven year period we are hoping to see one two three things you understand i think that is the point that he's trying uh, to, to to make i do i think he made mention about um okay. the pharmacy um pharmaceutical strategy yeah being at cabinet um i'm not sure it is at cabinet yet um, what the ministry is um, doing together with um, the JET and Palladium is that we've identified um, experts within the pharmaceutical industry to help fine tune the industry. That's why I was in my statement. I was making mention of the fact that this platform may come up with issues with policy formulation. Okay. Yes. So um, the consultants are on the ground. Um, they are embarking on um, stakeholder engagement. They are supposed to fine tune the strategy that was developed under the UNIDO um, program. And this will come up with a comprehensive policy different from the overgeneralized incentives that is scattering. If you go to GIPC, you may have some incentives. If you go to free zones, you may have some incentives. Even if you go to um, FDA, you may get some incentives. So, what this policy document is supposed to do is to have um, put all these um, policy measures, incentives together so that it may be a one-stop shop document that you may identify the policy instrument that is supposed to help um, addressing the issues facing the industry. So, um, Mr. Note, maybe within the next um, two to three months, the document may be ready. Um, we may come to um, stakeholders to validate the um, policy options, and then it may move to um, cabinet as is expected. And then after cabinet, depending on the incentive regulatory regime that has been identified within the policy, it may go to parliament. Okay. Likewise, what we have done for the automotive program, we may want to do a similar thing for the pharmaceutical industry. Okay. So that we may have specific incentives well tailored for the pharmaceutical industry, legislated to um, help in the development of the industry. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, your hand has been out for a while. Apologies. Yeah. Thank you very much. My question comes to um, Justina. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot. What is your definition for um, demand certainty? Demand certainty. What's your definition? Number two, um, project financing. What size can you take? For example, if somebody has a project of $35 million, bankable project, don't talk about bankability, bankable, because the project was developed with a DFI to bankability. Now, what's, what is, uh, what, what size can you take and how long can you give the debt? And you, the banks, will always request for equity contribution. You're saying that you will expect that government comes in and uh, provide the equity. We're not there yet. Government will not easily do that. The bank, do you have avenues of attracting equity funding or um, um, quasi equity to support your debt that you want to provide? Okay. Okay, so demand certainty, um, because we're talking about projects, we need to see some feasibilities that are done. We need to understand the markets where it's going. I remember the argument that we started with on whether we can produce enough um, painkillers for Ghana or whether um, we have enough because we have the rushes and co supporting the NS chemists and co locally. And that's why um, we think we must or must not produce or put limitations to it. We need to be able to say that, look, these are the number of people rising on an annual basis by why, a factor of why, um, who will be needing paracetamol so that we can put those, you know, all these um, ideas, assumptions, we must put in numbers to be able to see whether or not your project is viable. So that's what I mean by demand certainty. Um, things like COVID just threw themselves in there. But I'm sure for 
before you decide that you want to have a facility that produces vaccines and is meeting all the GMP standards, you want to make sure that there are some key things that it can do. Yes, when you get a, a windfall like COVID, you're happy, but otherwise, do we need enough vaccines? Yes, 25% Africa, um, we can only produce 25% of the vaccines we need, but the Indian market will still supply Africa because the limitations may not necessarily be provided by all African countries. So those are the things that we're talking about. Is it certain that what you say you are producing um, will have a market? Because really, it's the buy and sell of, of money. Um, the second one was it, the, the, the um, extent to which we'd be willing to finance. And I should ignore bankability. So you have a bankable project. You bring it to the bank. As Cal Bank, um, we do 25% of our net home funds if your um, project is secured. And secured takes me back to what Pruden said, um, you must have collateral. That is the law that we work with, and we must stay within the confines of the law. However, we as Cal Bank have gone to the extent of partnering other banks, and so we don't limit ourselves to the balance sheet of Cal Bank when it comes to any project. Um, we've done projects in excess of 100 million because we had information, we had a market out there from the financial perspective. We had good um, assumptions and uh, the discussion around the subjects, there's a need, there's a market, and we knew that it, it was going to produce the kind of results that we were expecting. And we've been able to raise those funds on the market. So we as a bank don't limit ourselves to how much our balance sheet can take. We have a team that works on syndicating facilities with um, other financial institutions. And then we look at the other instruments as well. There's a team that is into corporate finance. And so that team then looks for external partners if they want to do some equity, they want to do mez mezzanine type financing, they want to do PREF shares, um, we look at all of that and we can support you to come up with a financing or a capital structure that works for the project. Thank you, Justina. Um, so it's getting interesting, but we also have to round it up, right? And so I'm just going to go through the next steps so that people are prepared. We'll take closing remarks from uh, Mr. Pharmacist Harrison Abutiate, um, and then we'll take group photographs and then we'll do some media interviews and then that'll be end. But before we do that, I just want to be fair to Charles, because um, I mentioned you and he also made a comment. Um, do you still want to make your point? Yes. Okay, so Charles will finish and then we'll, 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 go, to, we'll go through the program as, as we have indicated. I believe the, this meeting is being held uh, with Ghana in mind, yeah. though personally now I've moved to thinking Africa. So the president of Ghana said he wants to establish Ghana as a pharmaceutical hub to support Africa. Mm -hmm. Currently, Ghana is in competition with North Africa. That is fast producing pharma to support the rest of Africa. South Africa has positioned itself strategically as a gateway for pharma for Africa. Nigeria, by virtue of their population of 220 million, is already having companies going to set in. As I had, the multinational, Sevier has bought a local plant, is producing out of Nigeria to solve to supply the rest of Africa. So very soon, quality, product quality credibility in Nigeria will not be an issue because most of their plants are becoming WHO, GMP qualified. And then also, Nigeria, NABDAC has done a policy of what they call five plus five. You produce a medicine there for the five, first five years, you can sell. The next five years, you need to show evidence of local pro, uh, manufacturing there. So because of the size of Nigeria and the size of Africa, Nigeria is gradually be look, becoming an attractive site for siting. So we cannot afford to have policies that we are taking up to 10 years to approve. If we want to be a hub, I have been a part of that document. I've seen it. We did so many workshops with GNDPC. Excellent document in terms of content. Mirroring experience from Ethiopia, his experience from in India. If we say we are still going stakeholder con discussion before we get there, go and do, we are already behind the queue. That is my that was my initial comment. And because we have our colleagues in uh, India on the on the line, 
I think Africa, everything has, a, has an advantage. We are the continent that is so now way back. So when we want to create solutions, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. The rest of the world has done it before. So we need to just cut the solution, trim it to fit our solution, and then we move. India has done this already. Indian companies are very are okay to come to Africa and come and do, to set up and do up with it. How do we work with our colleagues in India to partner so that they know how that they have, the resources that they have, they will partner locals to set up these plants and manufacture for Africa and move. Okay. So that's why I'm saying time is not on our side if we want to think Ghana. Mm -hmm. And if we want to think Africa, there, some of them have already bought into this and they are moving. The rest of the world is fast coming to Africa to come and set it as, an, as a solution. So the earlier we, we make ourselves ready and raise our hand as a the preferred solution, the FD of Ghana, the standards of authority of Ghana have what it takes to make brand Ghana, as someone said, their preferred choice in sub-Sahara. Right. So I'll take that as a closing remark. Um, Prudence, your one sentence, what do we do from here? What is your, your advice to us that we should go home with? Chimba is here to make it happen. Um, I, I think uh, for me what I look at is uh, um, how can we start producing in Africa? So the FCFTA is a market, but we don't want it to be a market for products coming from outside Africa. Okay. So um, I have seen on the continent, um, in the business of pharmacy, I think most uh, business uh, investors in the pharmaceutical products are very much interested in distribution. So I would rather um, encourage them to move to production. Move to production. Thank you. Justine. You still want to talk. No, <laughs> no one last word. Just well, um, I think that as much as possible, we should all try to be a little more innovative. Right. Um, stop the buy and sell. Um, and walk into CAL because it, we have quite a few solutions that can support your businesses and, and, and take you forward um, where you have to go. Thank you. Fine. Thank you very much. Um, from the policy perspective, um, I'll take comment from here. Mm -hmm. And then um, even though um, it's taking us 10 years, <laughs> I think that um, it's better late than never. So we will um, approach the industry still on this um, stakeholder engagement. Because before um, the development of that document, the AFCFT was still under conception. Yeah. So now that we've given back to the F AFCFTA, it further widens the market. Um, so for me, I will urge industry to take advantage of the existing opportunities within the industry, approach the right institutions, and then I'm sure they are ready to give them the facilities that will help them expand their markets. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. On this note, I'd like to bring the panel to an end. Shall we put our hands together for them? Oh, Ravi. I didn't forget you. I wanted to just let them clap, then I'll come to you. <laughs> Ravi, please, your closing remarks. Right. Yeah, no, it, it, it's fine. Actually, uh, I totally agree with the first two speakers. Uh, the collaborative approach in the area of manufacturing is very much needed, and uh, particularly in Africa. And most of the Indian companies started working in that direction. And the Indian missions in Africa also, they're encouraging this kind of uh, an approach. So in uh, Ghana, we have Indians uh, started their companies and people are uh, trying to invest in Ethiopia and Nigeria. So uh, what I observed during my interactions with uh, different chambers of different countries, so then nobody wants uh, now as a, India as a trader, one, not only as a trader, they want uh, India to invest and they wanted India to start manufacturing and uh, work closely with the, uh, these countries. So it's a very uh, welcoming step and uh, uh, certainly this uh, collaborative approach is needed. Thank you. Thank you. Ryan. Thank you. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you. And I'd like to thank my panelists for that engagement. Um, Carl Bank, I think we need to have a part two at some point. Um, but thank you so much, uh, Philip, for, uh, for, for, for availing 
your facilities and for yourself for this partnership and with the Chamber of uh, Pharmacy Ghana. And then the, the chief executive, the indefatigable chief executive, always pushing the frontiers. Thank you so much. So we'll now take our closing remarks from the chairman of the Chamber of Pharmacy, and then we will close. Let's welcome Mr. Harrison Abutati. I've been an ardent listener throughout this uh, conversation. And uh, I must say, this is not just a talk shop. It's been a wonderful exchange of excellent ideas. And uh, I, I even wonder whether I can summarize what happened. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because it's like going to a lecture where the professor is giving stuff throughout. Mm. You don't know what to take out and what to invite, <laughs> put on paper. But uh, I've been impressed. Uh, and first of all, Carl Bank, thank you so much for making it happen. Um, uh, of course, in collaboration with uh, the Chamber, Ghana National Chamber of Pharmacy. A lot of ideas have floated uh, during the conversation. The first one is we need collaboration among ourselves and also with government because most of the things that the private sector wants to do, the government has to know and know where we are going so they can facilitate the, the, the motion. In some cases, some of us feel government is putting too much stops in our movement, and therefore we must correct that from the start. Secondly, um, one of the things that always worry business people is financing. We've had a lot of talk, especially assurance from Carl Bank that they are ready and also from uh, AFCTA that they are also working with African Development Bank and other banks to help us come with facilities that can help us to do excellent work in producing quality pharmaceutical products for our countries and also for Africa. Uh, thirdly, we should look at Ghana because we actually have an excellent brand which we are not selling properly. Uh, our FDA is considered to be one of the top uh, regulatory bodies in the world, not only in Africa, but in the world. Uh, so people will believe the products, from a scar product that come from here, are quality products. And this is where we should be doing more than we are doing now. Um, if there's a gap to be filled, the gap is now with Africa, not only Ghana. We should think Africa. At, at first, we only thought of ECOWAS, but now the market is Africa. So we should begin to think about that. We should begin to look at uh, other people who can help us in Africa to make it happen. Yes, uh, and that's where we need some market research into the products that maybe will make us make big profits and big business in Africa, if syrups, uh, tablets, and the, uh, the products that were mentioned by some of the panelists are the things we should start from, let's make sure we know the markets that these products will go to and they'll be accepted in Africa so that at least we conquer Africa first before we even think of uh, going to the world. Um, which brings me to if we are going to conquer Africa. Can we have a logo made in Africa and promote it? Because to me, just promoting the, the putting the logo, the Ghana Standards Board logo, which says that our product is good for Ghana, can we have one for Africa so that you can have Ghana to show that the product is coming from Ghana, but also from Africa, so that it's also acceptable? Yeah, yeah. so if CTA, let's get a, a logo quality logo for Africa so that the products that come from here, when you see that uh, logo, then you know, yes, it's been tested and accepted in Africa. And, you know, Africa power is greatly admired <laughs> all over the world. So if we are able to promote that also, we should be able to conquer the world as we are trying to do. We need partners like India who, are, who have done it before. We are not going to invent the wheel, we'd like to 
copy the things that need copying and also ask them to support us, especially in production. Because when I look at our markets, that is where we have to work the, the personnel the, in the production area. Uh, uh, top, bottom, maybe we are okay. But bet between the two, if the machine stops, who is going to make sure it starts working? We need people like that. We need to train them. And the investors, uh, the technical investors, they should not, not just accept the name university. They should be technical as well, you know, so that they will do what we want them to do and uh, help us promote uh, the industry. Um, I cannot uh, end but um, add something about the farmer park with Dawa. You see, all the time we've been doing business as families and individuals. Even in developed countries, they are merging. So gradually, we should be thinking of merging. We cannot continue doing it. I mean, um, uh, the car lady, <laughs> yes, said it. If the head is gone, <laughs> the tail is useless, <laughs> you know. So we must begin to make things last, you know. We should merge. We should get more support. We economies of scale will help us to even survive as an industry. So let us be thinking of that all the time. The farmer park is an idea to bring some pharmacies together so that they can share the special uh, vehicles that will be made available to them. You know, and to me, it's an area that all pharmacies young and old should begin to look at and help. And if Carl Bank and other financial uh, institutions are prepared to help us to make that the, the hub of production in, in Ghana, in addition to the others that we have, will really make a mark. So on that note, I would like to say thank you all so much. I'm, I'm not giving the vote of chance. I hope yeah, somebody, no. but I could, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but I've been impressed with what I've seen here. My um, view is that the chamber is going to work closely with Carl Bank so that where we need to uh, go further, a step uh, further, we'll do that uh, so that today's beginning will really materialize in fruitful um, or fruits that all of us will uh, pluck and eat and enjoy them. Next time we meet here, which I hope will be soon, we'll be in a position to say that the meeting that started here, these are the fruits that have come out of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. MC, thank yeah. you also for coordinating whatever <laughs> has gone on here. Thank you, thank, thank you. you. Right, so um, the announcement is that we'll take a, a couple of photographs together. Um, did you want to make an announcement yourself? Yes, sir. A brief one. Um, we'll be having a farm affair in June. Uh, we'll be posting the details on the various platforms. We'll also be having a policy dialogue uh, also in June. So we'll also be posting the posters and then also invite members accordingly. There's going to be a program in collaboration of Israel Embassy that's to visit some of the companies that produces uh, equipment and then the other things. Uh, also to be held in June. Uh, the details will also be posted and then uh, uh, members could register as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Well, I'd like to... O online, okay. I would like to acknowledge um, Atlantic Pharmaceuticals represented here. Um, they are also doing a great project into manufacturing vaccines. I've seen Unicom is also represented. Unichem is represented here as well. Uh, Spinters Chemist is here. Thank you for coming, CPPA Chair as well. And everybody else, all the members of the chamber who are here. Um, Audrey, I see Audrey. Audrey is also here. Thank you so much for coming. And our audience online. Thank you so much for staying with us from the start or at any point in time, any point in time that you joined till now. Thank you so much uh, for, for that. But my special thanks also goes to my panelists and speakers 
thank you for the preparation and the research and the things that you've been able to share here. I really appreciate it. And then, I mean, the final and the topmost thanks goes to, I want to put together Mr. Abutiate and then Mr. Uh, and Phil, and Phil, Philip, uh, Philip and Harrison, thank you so much uh, for your leadership and for allowing us to do this. And all, all of you here, thank you so much. So we will close and then we'll take some pictures and then uh, we'll have some refreshments as well. Thank you so much, everybody. Dear Board of Directors, CEOs and industry, yes, all of industry should get this. In today's ever-growing marketplace, expansion and progress must certainly be on your mind. It is on ours too, because we look forward to grow with you. We are able to get as much financing as your corporate projects need and to see to their successful completion in the best possible timing. How? It's a new day. Well, we are responsible. We do business the right way, with regard for sound financial, social and ethical practices. We are effective, knowledgeable, and even more so with each new experience wielding expertise built from decades of facilitating the financing of the grandest of projects with exceptional dedication. We are decisive, not just because we take good decisions, but because we make sound decisions based on risk, local market knowledge, opportunity, and timing. In fact, there are several projects we have facilitated in the energy, real estate, education, power and manufacturing sectors to be modest. Surely your project is next. Contact us today so that we can move forward together. It is possible. Best regards, Carl Bank. Forward together.